What's up guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei. Welcome to, What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Shinobi with Gamer System. Part 2. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. She looked him in the eye and mustered the best smile she could to thank him, only to see him looking at her blankly. What? He blinked, looking utterly confused. Erm, is something wrong? Hinata asked, confused herself now. Yeah, what are you talking? He looked at her as if she was stupid. The shy thing's a turn-off for sure, as is the baggy clothes you always wear, and you have hair not far from Sasuke's, you'd look way better with longer hair, but beyond that, you're hot as crap. Eh? Hinata's mind was suddenly quite empty as utter confusion swept all of her thoughts away, and she stared at the muscular, tan-skinned boy sitting beside her. Don't get me wrong, Sakura's pretty, love that hair of hers, and she has a nice ass, but she's a skinny waif. No guy wants a chick like that. Daiki bluntly continued on before gesturing to her. Maybe when she stops dieting like she likes to do all the time that'll change for the better, but as things are right now, your body is way better than Sakura's. Better ass, nice hips, exotic eyes and a pair of tits that just don't quick. Hinata's mouth opened and closed, and she felt her face heat up to burning proportions at his crass words. I thought you were just shy in general and about how fast you're developing compared to the likes of her. But sheesh, to think your body is bad? Daiki shook his head. Man, no idea where you got that idea from. You mean you weren't just trying to make me accept and get over the fact I'm unattractive? Hinata absently asked. Hell no. Daiki snorted. Before suddenly his eyes widened. Wait. Don't tell me you actually thought this because Naruto likes Sakura and based attractiveness on that? Why did it seem so silly when he said it like that? She couldn't trust her voice, so just nodded. Daiki laughed. Naruto isn't in love with Sakura. Hell, he doesn't understand the concept. Trust me on that. He's been alone for so long nobody's taught him the difference. He pushed on. He's literally trying to be friends with her, but doesn't know how to do it. No idea why he's fixated on her like that. But yeah, at best, he has a small crush on her. He's not in love with her or anything like that. Daiki. It seemed he knew a lot about Naruto Kuen. She hadn't known any of that at all, despite all the time she'd watched him. I don't really know much about Naruto Kuen. Hinata realized. She didn't know what hobbies he had outside of training, what he liked to beyond that even and more. It was sobering. She had to try harder. But, putting that thought aside right now, didn't Daiki's words mean she was more attractive than Sakura? I'm good looking? She asked hesitantly for confirmation. Six out of ten. Better than Sakura who I'd rate three out of ten though. Daiki wasn't at all embarrassed to share his thoughts on her attractiveness. Grow your hair out and don't try and cover up that rocking bod of yours, and get rid of some of that shyness, and you could easily hit a 9 out of 10, maybe even full on 10 out of 10 depending on how you go from there. Her cheeks felt like they would burst into flames at any moment, and she had to resist the urge to go grab her jacket and put it on when his eyes once again drifted to her chest. The fronts of her melons were hidden by her arms, but he could still see the upper swells of her melons and down into her cleavage. But all the same, she felt one side of her lips twitch up at his words, and something stir in her chest. It made her arms shake. Yet was a good feeling that almost urged her to drop her arms and let him see fully. Nobody had ever so blatantly complimented her before, and expressed such a sure-fire belief in any of her potential. Longer hair, more stylish clothes, less shy. She chanted lightly to herself that. Was all she needed to completely dwarf Sakura in attractiveness? A thought suddenly occurred as Daiki tore his eyes away from her chest and grinned in a way that made him suddenly seem very handsome. What did you mean you would get benefits yourself out of helping me? Isn't that obvious? He snorted, raising an eyebrow at her. For one, I get experience fighting against the gentle fist, it's good training, and secondly, 
I got to ogle you at the same time, two benefits at the same time, gotta respect the grind like I've been telling you Hinata, get the most for your efforts, despite how absurd the situation was. Hinata couldn't help but giggle again. I see. Thank you Daiki, you've taught me a lot. She smiled at him. Despite the crudeness of it all, she was very thankful for his upfront honesty with her. And what he said, and the way he acted, it put a lot into perspective for her, and made the world seem just a little bit more open to her. Like I told you, you don't need to thank me, he repeated himself from earlier. Pretty sure I'm the one who got the most out of this. His eyes dipped to her chest once more for a brief moment, a blatant obvious look, before he looked back up and winked at her. She could have stayed here and listened to him praise her for hours. It was like she was someone who had been lost in the desert for so long, had suddenly found a beautifully full oasis of crystal clear water to drink from. She could not though. It was almost time for her to meet her team. Is it okay if I join you again for training sometimes? Hinata asked before she left, as she stood up and retrieved her jacket. Fine with me. I'm generally here a lot of the time when I've not got something to do or have missions. Daiki shrugged. Feel free to hit me up anytime you want. Hinata gave him a wide smile before bowing to him politely in thanks. It was only as she did and saw him grinning, his eyes looking below her face that she realized her large melons were dangling quite noticeably from it. She may have stayed in that position for a few dozen more seconds than necessary before standing up and pulling her jacket on, bidding the younger boy goodbye and walking away. Hinata almost tripped as a wolf whistle echoed from behind her, followed by Daiki's voice cheering. I hate to see you go, but I sure do love to watch you leave. His words confused her for a moment, until she looked over her shoulder to see him eyeing her retreating backside. She couldn't wipe the massive smile from her face as she made her way to meet her team, and there was a bit of spring in her step all the way. As soon as Hinata was out of sight, Daiki stood up and stretched his arms out, well, that was interesting. He hummed to himself. There was a puff of smoke at his side, and all of a sudden Kakashi Hitaki was by his side, making him jump, startled. The heck are you doing? Daiki calmed his racing heart and growled in annoyance. He really needed to find a way to up his sensory abilities. You're about as smooth as sandpaper, huh? Kakashi replied with instead, snorting. Don't you think you played it up a bit too much for the girl? This pervert was watching us. Daiki resisted the urge to cringe. Maybe... He forced himself to shrug. But hammering it in like that will help her in the long run. We'll make sure it's reinforced. Plus, it wasn't often one could be so blatant about checking out a good-looking girl. Still, to think she thought she was unattractive. He shook his head at the sheer absurdity of it. Hayashi had really killed any pride in that girl. Huh? Well, hopefully that helped her out and she wasn't bad company on top of being nice to look at and useful for getting those gains in taijutsu. Still, time to address the elephant in the room. So why are you here? He asked Kakashi, confused. I've not made any more bets with Sasuke, but I won't say no to two more jutsu. Since he'd met Sasuke and gotten the fireball jutsu from him, the Uchiha had turned up to his training ground twice to spar, and he'd won both. He'd even more or less caught up to Sasuke in physical speed as well. Still, each spar was close as hell and the force palm jutsu was what kept him ahead of Sasuke. MMM. I'll think about it, Kakashi shrugged, which probably meant no, but whatever. As for why I came to speak to you and heard your adorable little flirting and confidence-boosting conversation with the cute little Hyuga heiress, my team has a mission. The Hokage asked me to let you tag along. What? Daiki asked, confused. Why? Kakashi shrugged again. Apparently you caught the Hokage's eyes, and he feels like it's a waste for you not to get a shot at the Chunin exams. The man explained boredly. This mission is a B-rank in name only mind you, just a simple VIP escort mission. It will only take a day and will look good on your record. Oh, that made sense. He had stood out a little to the Hokage with his last mission and seemed to have shown a decent bit of potential with him getting the chameleon contract. He should get around to summoning soon now that he thought about it. He'd been waiting until his chakra capacity was quite a bit larger to get fully into it. He should have enough now to summon lower level chameleons without too much issue. All right, when? He asked. We'll be meeting at the north gates in two hours from now, Kakashi replied. Best get ready quickly. Daiki nodded in understanding. 
that gave him a decent while to rest and recover the chakra he'd used up this morning during training. I'll meet you guys there, then. He replied and made to leave. Before you leave, there's something I want to ask you, or at least point out. Kakashi's voice stopped him. You seem to know a lot about Naruto, despite rarely interacting with him. Daiki paused. How annoying. He wouldn't have said what he had to Hinata, if he knew Kakashi was watching. Thankfully, this he'd long since prepared an excuse for. I'm not an idiot, you know, Daiki responded, looking over his shoulder and smirking at Kakashi. I'll lay it out simply for you to connect the dots. My parents were killed by the QB. Naruto was born on October 10th, the very same night. There's an absurd hatred directed at him by the older generation of this village, and to sum it up, as you've probably noticed, I'm pretty decent at Fuinjutsu. He tossed a wave over his shoulder at Kakashi, flashing his tattooed palm at the man, before continuing on. I see, Kakashi mused, nodding. There was no need for some long-drawn-out excuse, keeping it vague was the best way to go about it. Hinting at knowing about Naruto's Jinchuriki status, and his dead parents were good enough reason for him to have kept an eye on Naruto and learned about him. Unlike your standard scrub genin, Daiki did not need to bother with a backpack to carry his equipment and supplies for the mission. Though, maybe that wouldn't be a bad idea. He mused as he approached the north gates of the village. Not a backpack with supplies, but rather, perhaps some kind of weighted back or torso weights. He could really up the grind even further with that. He put it out of mind as he reached the gate, finding Naruto, Sakura, and Sasuke already waiting. Sasuke greeted him with a nod, while Sakura waved at him. Hey Daiki, going out on a mission? The pink-haired girl asked. Yep, he nodded. With you guys actually, apparently I'm supposed to tag along. Eh? Naruto sounded off loudly. But why? We don't need your help. We're the best. Do you have to complain about everything? Sakura groaned. After the way wave went, I'm totally fine with the extra help. Right, Sasuke Kuen? She immediately looked towards the boy for his approval. Sasuke shrugged. I don't really care either way, he replied, before smirking at Daiki. Crossing his arms coolly and leaning against the gate frame. Just don't slow me down. Right back at you, Daiki snorted. The record is three to zero in my favor, remember? That was a long time ago. Sasuke shrugged. It was a week ago, Daiki pointed out dryly. Semantics? The Uchiha rolled his eyes. I've grown much stronger since then, learned a new powerful jutsu and a few techniques. Things won't end the same way next time we spar. Ah, look at you cute little genin getting along like barking dogs. Kakashi's voice cut in before he could respond. It brings a tear to this old man's eye. You're late, Naruto growled at him. Kakashi ignored him and gestured to his side, where a tall, willowy man with long brown hair stood, dressed in blue, a headband depicting the symbol of the hidden waterfall village tied around his forehead. So, this is our client, he explained. His name is Shibuki. He's the leader of the waterfall village. Our job is to escort him back home more or less. Don't you feel important? The man, Shibuki introduced himself while Naruto and Sakura together griped at Kakashi for making them wait so long. From what he idly made out, they were actually supposed to meet an hour ago. Still, all that was mostly drowned out as Daiki stared at the waterfall shinobi. Don't tell me, he thought. He remembered this guy from a mini-side movie. Something told Daiki this wasn't going to be as simple a mission as Kakashi claimed it would be. Not long later, they were on the road, moving at a slow pace along the path heading out of Kanoha and through the huge trees along the way. Why are we walking, though? Daiki had to wonder. No, seriously, why? He could understand if Shibuki was a civilian, but he wasn't, he was a shinobi. So Shibuki. Sakura struck up conversation not long after leaving the village. Since you're the leader of your village, doesn't that make you the Takakage? Um, Shibuki blinked. I suppose so? Wow, and you're so young. She praised him, making the man laugh sheepishly. Honestly, calling him a Kage is insulting to Kage. Daiki resisted the urge to snort. Instead, he slowed down a bit and dipped to the back of the group, so he didn't need to talk to anyone, guarding the rear with Sasuke. If things were going to go pear-shaped on this mission, then he wanted to be as prepared as possible. 
and there was one technique he could work on that shouldn't be too hard. Naruto got it down instantly more or less after all. With a small flare of chakra, a small puff of smoke erupted from his right palm, and suddenly he was holding a white-hilted tanto. Sasuke raised an eyebrow at him, but said nothing. Hours later, Daiki had to wonder, is Naruto really a damn prodigy after all? Because he'd expended a decent little chunk of chakra, and all he'd managed to do so far was coat the sword in his chakra. It was a lot harder to convert the flowing chakra into the lightning element. He briefly got it to spark for a bit, startling the others with him, but he hadn't been able to hold it. He was missing some, a spark of knowledge, the trick to keeping it going. He knew he was on the cusp of it though, it was like having a word on the tip of your tongue, but just not remembering it. Typical. Why couldn't things ever be easy for him? Deciding to chuck it in for now and recover his chakra, Daiki sealed the tanto back in his palm. No matter, I just have to grind more. He nodded to himself. The grind would never betray him in the end. Giving up? Kakashi asked, eyeing him with amusement. Just taking a break to think, the genin rolled his eyes. You already know what I'm missing anyway. Why not just tell me? The asshole had been peeking over his shoulder at him struggling along with the chakra flow technique before giggling and going back to his smut. Ah, but then I'd be depriving you of a wonderful learning experience. Kakashi, I smiled. Prick, I hate you. Daiki deadpanned. And thus my day is complete. Kakashi snorted, turning back to his book. Hate him. Hate him so much. A pat on his shoulder distracted him, and he looked to see Sasuke giving him an understanding nod. You see why I'm beginning to envy you? He asked dryly. Yes, yes, he freaking did. Daiki nodded. Somehow. Just the fact that there was a guy who knew all the answers he needed, that was right there and able to help him easily, yet for his own amusement not doing so, somehow made the gains even slower. He was clearly a heretic to the grind. It wasn't long later that they arrived, more or less at their destination. It would have went much quicker, even with walking, if Shibuki wasn't jumping at every shadow and hiding behind Sakura, multiple times, after birds made loud squawking noises above. Kakashi had went into an explanation, when Sakura asked, about Shibuki's father, the old leader of Taki. A man who fought off the current Tsuchikage to protect his village, and losing his life later in the process after the fight. Shibuki wasn't even worth calling him a shadow of the man. Daiki shook his head, and instead focused on the absolutely massive waterfall cascading down the side of a huge mountain, it was quite a view, he had to admit. Maybe even worth putting up with Skrubuki. Shibuki-sama! Two kids rushed over just as they stopped at the base of the waterfall, carrying rubbish bags. Hey! Hey, don't come co close! Shibuki rebuked them, when they stopped in front of him. I'm the village leader you know! Daiki resisted the urge to snort. Instead, he sat down on a nearby tree trunk. We're out here cleaning up the river you know? The small cute girl of the two. Wearing her brown hair and toe pigtails and with her bangs combed over one I responded. He vaguely remembered her as well. Well whatever, Daiki tuned them out. He continued ignoring them even as Shibuki roped them in to help them clean litter out of the river, as an extra D-rank mission and Kakashi agreed. Much to Naruto's vocal annoyance. He was quick to give in though when the kids thanked him. Ever eager to please others who were nice to him or stroked his ego. Kakashi sat on a rock to the side of him with Shibuki. You know, you should help them as well. He beckoned at the three of Naruto, Sasuke and Sakura at the river surface, picking up trash and loading it into bags. I would, but it would deprive them of a wonderful and fulfilling experience of community service. Daiki responded dryly. Besides, I only signed up for this mission, and you aren't my sensei, so you can't make me do it like them. Ah! Frustrated at your inability to succeed? I see, I see. Kakashi nodded sagely, before turning to Shibuki. So, what do you make of the recent rumors of suspicious activity going around in this general area lately? He asked, ending his conversation with Daiki. To hell with Ranmer's eyes. Maybe plucking that eye out of Kakashi's head and killing him would be worth going missing Nin? A small grunt at his other side made him look to the girl, Shizuku, to see her struggling to drag the trash bag off to be disposed of. Here, I'll get it, Daiki offered, 
standing you and grasping the opening of the bag and easily hefting it up. Ah, thanks Onii-chan. She smiled at him brightly. You're so strong, she praised. I am. From a lot of hard work? He agreed, and promptly flashed a middle finger over his shoulder at Kakashi when the man snorted. So, can you show me where to get rid of this Shizuka-chan? Sure, follow me. Skipping forward happily, Shizuku gestured for him to follow her. He was led through the forest to what looked like a dumping ground. Shizuku helpfully informed him that everything pile up there was destroyed completely at the end of each month. Though, she didn't actually know how, so couldn't tell him the exact details. Why don't they just seal it all away? He had to wonder. Storage scrolls were piss easy to make. He'd learned how to do so in roughly two weeks or so, and they couldn't tell him they had no sealing expertise in their village. They had food, didn't they? The Seven Tails Jinchiriki. Someone in there had to have sealed the Nanabai into her. Man, if only he could examine Fu's seal. It was bound to be much weaker than the Eight Trigram seal, yet at the same time much easier to learn. He put that out of mind and walked Shizuku back to the riverfront, though he was a bit surprised about a certain someone being gone. Where's Kakashi? He asked Sasuke who was his way with a bag held over his shoulder. As Shizuku shipped back over to help the others continue cleaning up the trash in the river. Who knows? He shrugged. He got a messenger hawk, then rushed off somewhere. Told us to head back to Kanoha once we're finished cleaning up this trash. Giving him a nod, Sasuke trekked down the path Daiki just came from, muttering under his breath about Kakashi all the way. Kakashi just left? Left the last Uchiha and the Kyubi Jinchiriki alone outside another village? Bullcrap. Daiki narrowed his eyes, making his way back over to sit down on the tree stump he'd claimed. Something was clearly going on behind the scenes, clandestine and something that was to be kept off the books. Kakashi must have another mission in the area and is using us as a smokescreen. He mused. He also couldn't be sure the Hokage actually signed him off for this mission. Kakashi clearly saw how strong he was, and perhaps fibbed a bit to get Daiki to accompany him so he could work as backup for Sasuke, Naruto, and Sakura. And there was no point in even bringing up those suspicions with the Hokage either, because if the mission was as important as it was for Kakashi to ditch Naruto and Sasuke for a bit outside the village, then the Hokage would totally cover for him. Well, whatever. He just had to be ready for when whatever enemies in the area attacked. Besides, this would be another good test for how much he'd progressed. At least there was entertainment in the meantime, like Naruto annoying Shizuku by making fun of Shibuki, and her pushing him straight into a piece of dog crap. It was the little things that mattered in life. In the meantime, he ran his hands over his wrists and ankles, sealing away his weights for now. After Naruto managed to wash the clumps of dog crap from his sandals and between his toes, the blonde-haired boy collapsed on his backside. You know, I'm pretty hungry, he declared and looked over at everyone. What do you say we take a break and eat some food? Actually, I could go for Dash Daiki began, but before he could fully agree, he was cut off. If you're going to eat, you can leave, Shibuki scoffed rudely. You're pretty much done already, so we can call it here and part ways now. Daiki worked his jaw back and forth and resisted the urge to smack him one. The guy was already annoying him. Cutting him off like that was grating on top of it. Ha! Naruto growled jumping to his feet, with sandals making squishing noises in the grass. What a thing to say after us helping you back here. You're a real lousy jerk, Databeo. Daiki found himself nodding in agreement. Not that any of it really mattered, since he already knew where the entrance to the village was. Enough, Naruto, we'll do just that. Sasuke cut in, giving Shibuki a terse nod, before turning on his feet and walking away. Sakura called after him and rushed over to him, making him pause. The entrance to his village must be nearby. He doesn't want us finding the entrance. But Leaf and Waterfall are allies, right? Sakura protested. So what if we know where the entrance is? Fei! Shibuki spat to the side. Maybe, for now. But can you say that you'll always be loyal to your village and never betray it? If you ever did, you'd pose a massive risk to our village. Sound logic. Daiki shrugged an annoying-ass coward he may have been. But he was right on the money there at the very least. That's right, Sasuke agreed. 
Naruto growled. Now you're questioning how loyal we are. You bastard. He snarled at Shibuki. He's right you know. Sakura for once, was in agreement with Naruto. At least say thanks. Well, he was definitely an ungrateful prick about it. Daiki mused, hopping off the tree trunk he was sitting on and walking over to join Sasuke. Shibuki ignored him, growling right back at Naruto, before huffing and looking away. Just leave already. KH, we will. Naruto scoffed, turning on his heel and walking over to the rest of the squad. We want nothing to do with a place like this anyway. See you later, Naruto, Daiki and Aichan. Shizuku opted to wave them goodbye instead of getting absorbed in the nonsense. Y, yeah. Naruto stammered, unable to hold his angry expression at her earnest goodbye and waved his hand over his shoulder. Later, Shizuku, Daiki bid her goodbye. Maybe he was wrong about things going south? Like, he remembered Naruto freely using Kurama's chakra in Waterfall. He didn't learn to do that until the Chunin exams, which were two and a half months away. He was about to turn and leave with Team 7. When he froze, a tingle running down his spine and Daiki whipped around, glaring at the huge waterfall, and at the same time, Mom! Shizuku's horrified scream an instant later made him whip around again, just in time to see a heavy-set, warm-faced woman stumbling out of the forest. She was struggling step by step, panting deeply and pale-faced. Sure, Bukisama, danger, in the village, she managed to utter before falling forward. She would have landed flat on her face if Daiki didn't leap into action, crossing the distance between them in a blink and catching her. As he did, he noticed a kanai was lodged pretty deep into her back. A lady of this age and a civilian, making her way here with this in her. He grimaced. It was impressive of her. The strength of a mother fearing for her child. Huh? Mom, mom. Shizuku rushed over in tears. Please be okay, she begged. Daiki plastered a reassuring smile on his face. She'll be fine, Shizuku, I promise. He told her, before gently laying the woman down to the ground. As he did, he caught sight of Shibuki. He'd completely locked up and was shaking with terror at the news she brought. Some freaking Takakich. Daiki, Sasuke shouted, getting his attention. I know. He nodded in reply, hiding they may have been, but they weren't any good at concealing their presence properly. Sakura, come over here and keep pressure on this lady's wound. Naruto, guard them. Right. Sakura agreed, rushing over, dropping to her knees over the lady and doing just that. Don't tell me what to do. Naruto griped, but he did as asked, pulling out a pair of kanai and taking up a guard position. Just as he did, there was a chorus of splashing water, and from the waterfall a group of shinobi, all dressed in gray and light blue burst of the waterfall, eight in total and only one of them stood out, a tall muscular man, wearing a sleeveless black muscle shirt and a pair of arm warmers. Gotcha! The standout leader gleefully shouted, whipping his hand out alongside his apparent subordinates, each of them unleashing a bevy of shuriken and kanai towards the biggest target, Daiki, and those around him. Like hell! Daiki thrust both arms out, palms wide open and flared his chakra through his palms. Force palm jutsu, he shouted. Twin coronas of pure wind force erupted, merging together into a huge gale of force and tore the rain of weapons from the sky, in the process, slamming into two of the attacking shinobi, while the others avoided the concussive blast. He didn't hold back this time at all though, and used both together. The audible crunch of their bones echoed throughout the area, before they fell to their deaths. Six left and they hit the ground running. They ignored Sasuke entirely and rushed Daiki's area. Clicking his tongue, Daiki held out his hand and summoned his Tonto. Ignoring Sasuke was a mistake. Getting behind them in a blur, Sasuke unwound a demon windmill shuriken and whipped it through the air. It tore through the gap between them like a buzz saw. Just as it was about to catch the leader in the back though, he scoffed, Nice try, kid, he hollered, jumping over it and letting it wind clearly beneath him. Light glinted behind the shuriken and Sasuke jerked his hand back, ninja wire becoming visible attached to the shuriken and pulling it right back around at the leader. The leader's eyes widened noticeably, before with a growl, 
He ran through a few hand seals, and with a puff of smoke was replaced by a log that the huge shuriken pierced into. Only for a second shuriken to seemingly materialize from the shadow of the first as it stabbed into the log and pinged through the air to stab deep into the side of one of the other shinobi. Shadow shuriken, Daiki realized. With the leader out of the way, and the subordinates now cut down to four, Daiki exploded forward in a blindingly fast shunshin. Three juked around him. The path of a shunshin was obvious, but his target had no chance to even attempt to dodge before Daiki's tanto pierced his throat and ended his life. Shadow clone jutsu. He heard Naruto shout from behind him and the clang of metal and ripped his tanto free from the corpse's throat and with a thought, sealed it again. Daiki grinned as he caught sight of all three being held up by clones of Naruto. The blonde had sent out multiple clones to take them on and hold them back to protect the others, and left a perfect little bit of distance for him. Rapidly his hands came together before flashing through a sequence of hand seals. Electricity sparked around his hands as he finished and he thrust out both hands. Lightning style, electromagnetic murder, he roared. Dozens of forks of lightning exploding through the air towards them held up by Naruto. And with the sheer speed of his jutsu, the three of them, alongside Naruto's clones, had no chance of dodging. They screamed in agony and their bodies completely locked up and began spasming as the lightning ran through their veins and cooked them from the inside out. The smell of sizzling flesh riding on the air. They died quickly, while Naruto's clones puffed out of existence. Holy crap databeo! Naruto gaped. That is such a cool jutsu. Sadly, Daiki didn't have time to bask in the awe of his fellow genin and whirled around to where Sasuke was to see him engaging the leader in a rapid back and forth of taijutsu. Sasuke had the edge in speed and skill, but the man was taller, had a longer reach, and was edging him out in pure physical strength. Sasuke, fireball. Daiki called out, already going through the hand seals. Right. Sasuke agreed, catching on quick and disengaged from his opponent, jumping back. It left the man with his back towards the waterfall with Daiki and Sasuke pincering him on either side and going through identical hand seals as one. Both Jenin finished and cupped their fingers around their mouths and exhaled powerfully. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. Damn it! The man shouted angrily with little place to run. If he jumped back onto the water, he'd be a sitting duck. He ran through a rapid set of hand seals himself. Water style water wall. Spinning. The man exhaled himself and spewed out a surge of water that swept around him to block the pair of fire jutsu. Steam erupted when they impacted, blanketing the area. Daiki kept his ears peeled and slowly started going through a few more hand seals, preparing to unleash another jutsu and kill him for good. But when the steam died down a moment later, he was nowhere to be seen. Damn it, he ran. Sasuke cursed probably back into the village then. No way a troop this small and weak could threaten an entire village, even a minor one. Daiki agreed, easing up on his hand seals. There's probably more already in there, probably much stronger ones at that. If he remembered right, one of them was at least a jonin and a traitor to Waterfall, nowhere near Kakashi's level, but a jonin nonetheless. Sasuke nodded, before glaring over at Shibuki, who had collapsed to his knees and huddled into a shiver, cowering ball. Daiki bore witness to a rather shocking and odd event. Sasuke gaping stupidly in shock. The last Uchiha had no words for the scene before him, and clearly couldn't understand it either. It would have made for quite the comical sight that Daiki would have had a grand time laughing about, at any other time. Sadly, he could not. How is she Sakura? Daiki rushed over to the group huddling over Shizuka's mother. It's not deep that she'll die right away, but she needs medical attention right away or... The pink-haired girl looked up and explained, before trailing off. Shizuku's lips trembled, tears streaming from her eyes. Is... is mom gonna die Daikinaiken? She asked, despair in her voice. She'll be fine. Daiki pat her head reassuringly and smiled gently at her. I'll make sure I promise. She sniffled, but put on a brave face and nodded at his words. Shibuki could learn a thing or two from a girl like this. He resisted the urge to snort derisively and drop to his knees, running through hand seals. Mystical palm jutsu. The tan, muscular boy declared, green light flaring to life around his hands, and he directed it to the women collapsed below him. Medical ninjutsu. Sakura gasped, 
eyes going wide with awe. Too bad that once again he could not bask in it, and this time it was from a pretty girl, a 3 out of 10 on his personal thick smashable babe scale even. She had the ass and hips to qualify, okay? Once Daiki removed the kanai from Shizuku's mother and healed her up enough to make sure her life wasn't in any danger, the group quickly located deeper into the forest, out of sight and sound. Daiki sat his ass down against a tree, catching his breath, and Shizuku immediately slammed into his side and huddled against him, arms wrapped around his midsection. She apparently found comfort during this situation in being close to him. Daiki, how much chakra have you got left? Sasuke got right down to the brass tacks as soon as he finished healing the woman. You fired off quite a few jutsu there. Enough? Daiki answered. About three quarters of my total. I've got enough in the tank to put the boot to these idiots' asses. Sasuke nodded. Right? He crossed his arms. Before looking at Shibuki. Looks like our mission continues then. Shibuki opened his mouth, but Daiki cut him off. That is unless you don't want our help? He raised an eyebrow pointedly. The leader of Waterfall grimaced. No. I suppose there's no choice. He visibly trembled for a moment before swallowing and composing himself. Oh yeah. Naruto pumped his fist. Now we can go pay those clowns back for jumping us like that. My thoughts, exactly. Sasuke smirked. Sakura, you stay here and guard the kids and the kid's mother. We'll be going ahead. Sakura grimaced, but nodded. All right, Sasuke-kun. I'll keep them safe, she promised. Well, even she can't mess up hiding away far away from the fight and looking over a few kids, Daiki mused before slowly standing up. I'm gonna go take care of these idiots invading your village, K? He pressed his hand atop Shizuka's head, gently forcing her to let go. Okay. Kick their butts in Aichan. The young girl rubbed her eyes before cheering him on. He flashed her a confident smile and a thumbs up, before joining Sasuke, Naruto, and Shibuki to head out towards the waterfall village. Shibuki led them back towards the river, and then towards the waterfall itself, edging around the water surface over a series of rocks that led to a round behind the huge waterfall. So your village is hidden behind a place like this, huh? Sasuke mused thoughtfully. Shibuki sighed. Let me be clear, do not tell anyone about this entrance. He ordered voice serious and level, for once. He hopped down off of the rock surface, onto a narrow pathway that was only about a foot wide. We know, we know. Naruto rolled his eyes, hopping down after him, followed by Naruto and Daiki himself. Continuing on, Shibuki led them over the path, to directly behind the waterfall itself, where a large cavern system seemed to lay. But, there was little to it, just a wide empty cavern, beyond the large holes filled with water. Just as I remember, Daiki nodded to himself. As one, all four of them quickly took position behind a large rock outcropping near the entrance, Daiki on the far most left and Sasuke the far most right with Naruto and Shibuki in the middle. Be ready, Naruto, Sasuke ordered. That's my line. The blonde shot back, drawing a kunai and preparing. Daiki ignored them, spreading his awareness out. But he couldn't feel anyone in the cavern beyond them, and not a sound echoed beyond that of dripping water. It's fine. There's no enemies in here that I can sense. Daiki voiced. If there was an enemy in here in such close proximity that he couldn't sense, they'd have far bigger things to worry about than getting into the waterfall village anyway. Shibuki, who had crouched down and covered his head with his hands, perked up at the mention of no enemies and stood up, pushing past the three boys and making his way around the rocky outcropping towards the holes filled with water. This way, he ordered, beckoning the three Kanoha Genin to follow. Hurry, he prompted them, before diving straight into the, the first hole of water. Hey Sasuke, Daiki. Naruto gave them both a blank look. Sasuke sighed. We have no choice, he huffed, before following after Shibuki, prompting Naruto to do the same. Daiki rolled his eyes and did the same. Why did he have to be so dramatic about leading the way into the hole? He could have literally just pointed and said, there's the entrance, but no, he had to be all dramatic about it, as if it was some big revelation and trying to shock them by jumping into the water-filled holes. Drama Queen The Tan Genin huffed, the sounds of water splashing loudly as Sasuke and Naruto dove in after Shibuki. Seriously, 
as if it wasn't obvious that those water-filled holes were the entrances to anyone with half a brain. Holding his breath, Daiki copied them and dove in. Sound became muted by the water around him, and he swam downwards alongside his fellow Jenin, finding a narrow cavern at the bottom stretching forward and glowing with a faint green light. He met the eyes of Sasuke and Naruto who were examining it, before nodding at them and swimming forward through it, towards the faint silhouette of Shibuki, he could see about 30 feet in front. Do you think they'll be okay? Shizuku fretted as she hovered over her mother, her friend, holding her hand to help her keep calm. Sakura gave the younger girl a smile. Don't worry, Naruto. Despite being an idiot is pretty strong. She reassured the girl. And Sasuke Kuen and Daiki are the two strongest genin in Konoha. Honestly, it still astounded her that Daiki was actually stronger than Sasuke Kuen now, but it made some sense, since he had much more time to himself to train. She knew after all, after Wave, that she was dragging her team down, Naruto was far stronger than her, never mind Sasuke Kuen, and she was even hampering Sasuke Kuen in getting stronger. She was really glad Daiki was around to help and pick up her slack. Between those three, whoever is causing trouble in your village doesn't stand a chance, the pink-haired girl continued. I mean you saw how easy they beat those other guys, right? Ho! Oh, now that's interesting to hear. An unfamiliar, male voice suddenly sounded behind her. Sakura's eyes widened and her hand shot down to her pouch. But before she could even reach it, she felt a sharp impact on her neck and everything went dark. Oh wow! Naruto trailed off with a gasp as soon as they surfaced, within the middle of a huge lake and Daiki couldn't blame him. They'd had to swim upwards thousands of feet to reach where they were right now, finding themselves within the confines of the top of the mountain, where the waterfall led from. In front of him, he could see a mass of land, filled with beautiful greenery, with a village settlement spread throughout it. Meanwhile behind him, there was another landmass, this time, an island right in the middle of the huge lake. The only thing atop this island, though, was a single tree, an absolutely gargantuan tree, it had to be at least 500 feet weight and stretched so far up into the sky he couldn't even measure it properly, but he could tell from the get-go it was at least as large as tall as the mountain it resided in. Huge tree branches spread out over the top, creating a massive green camouflage with the many tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, or even millions of thick, healthy green leaves. The branches were so thick, they spread out over the entirety of the top of the open mountain top, blocking it more or less, completely. Village hidden in the waterfall indeed. That meant, the only entrances to the village were either through the actual raging waterfall, or the holes Daiki and his companions just came through. That tree. His thoughts trailed off as he stared at it. While even with its size it still couldn't compare, it did remind him of it. The Shinju, the god tree from which the chakra fruit sprung from, which Kagaya Atsatsuki her power. The hero water comes from this tree as well. Daiki's eyebrows furrowed in thought. Was there a connection of some kind? Daiki. Sasuke called to him, breaking him from his thoughts. The Uchiha met his eyes and gestured with him to follow along with them as they swam towards the shore of the village. He nodded, putting his thoughts aside for now and made his way to the shore with them. Man, I've never seen such a pretty place. Naruto looked around in awe when they reached the surface. Man, I wish Sakura could have gotten to see it too. Daiki frowned, looking around. It was quiet, eerily quiet. And there was not a single person in sight. He caught the frown on Sasuke's face and knew he was thinking the same. It was only then, Daiki noticed something else. Where the hell is Shibuki? He wondered. He was right behind him, so how did that coward give him the slip? Just then Daiki's senses went haywire and he jumped back just as a series of shurikens screamed through the air towards him. Sasuke moved at the same time, pushing Naruto out of the way of a set going after him, and deflecting them with a drawn kanai. The hell was that F-Naruto growled as he landed in the water, before realizing what was going on. From behind the closest village houses, dozens of shinobi dressed the same as the ones from earlier came rushing out, blitzing towards them. Go protect Shibuki! Sasuke shouted at Naruto. The blonde growled again, but dove into the water, out of the way despite his reluctance, leaving the pair of Daiki and Sasuke to deal with their approaching enemies. Just like the ones before, Daiki noticed, 
they all wore headbands depicting the symbol of the village hidden in the rain, each with slashes through the middle. Honestly, it was quite a lot of rain shinobi in total, this time he counted 12, which made for 20 at least. It was like they deserted en masse. Had Nagato already taken over the rain village and killed Hanzo? That didn't matter for now, he supposed. Whipping his hand out, Daiki flared his chakra, summoning and shooting forth a series of kanai, shuriken and swords, a small wall of pointy death straight towards the approaching shinobi, before shooting forward himself. Most of them avoided easily. One did not and was riddled with the weapons, falling dead a moment later. See, that was the problem with rushing in a group. It left you little room to dodge if you were focused on by the enemy. Tora! One of them roared angrily, rage-filled eyes settling on Daiki. They were spreading out, trying to flank them from all sides and surround them. But Daiki wasn't about that crap. He made a beeline towards the one who shouted. Die! The man shouted as they approached one another. Just as they were in front of one another though, Daiki whipped his hand out again, unleashing his force palm jutsu from his left hand and spinning. He torqued around the man's lunging stab with his kanai, aimed for the Tantine's throat, and man didn't even have time to register his make before Daiki's massively momentum-enhanced knee strike smashed into his temple and crunch went his skull. Then, not taking any time to admire his handiwork, he thrust both hands out again, unleashing the force palm jutsu a second time, jettisoning him backwards through the air like a bullet. He flipped backwards, coming down into a handstand right below another of the men and thrust up with a double mule kick right up at his chin. He, like his fellow, was far too slow to react to the sudden spastic movement and his head snapped up and backwards, his neck breaking audibly and tumbling backwards from the sheer force of the blow. He was just in time to get an upside-down view of Sasuke leaping into the air, his hand cupped around his mouth, fire-style, fireball jutsu. He unleashed a huge fireball down below, catching four of the rain ninja before they could escape the blast radius and their screams echoed loudly as they were burned alive. Daiki didn't have time to admire it, because a third changed paths, rushing towards Daiki, twin kanai held in his grasp. Thinking quickly, Daiki unleashed another shot of the force palm jutsu from both hands into the ground, shooting him up into the air above the man, just as he shot forward, slicing his kanai where Daiki's belly was just a mere moment ago. Flipping around above, Daiki copied Sasuke, running through hand seals of his own, before inhaling and exhaling powerfully, spitting out a quick fireball jutsu of his own. The man, like his fellows, screamed in agony as he was cooked to death. He landed, and looked to Sasuke, surrounded by the remaining shinobi, only four of them. But he didn't have to. Sasuke unleashed a rain of shuriken from his hands, wide and winding, easily dodged by the rain shinobi except for the wires wrapped around them that bound them in their attempt to dodge. Wires leading back to Sasuke's hands and up to one single one in his mouth. The Uchiha teen running through four rapid hand seals, before flames sparked into existence, before traveling along the wires and lighting the trapped shinobi alight. The air was filled with the scent of burning flesh. Running chakra through his palms, Daiki triggered the return seal on his weapons and summoned them back to his dimension force seal. Is that them all? he wondered. They weren't a very impressive at all. They were weaker, even, than Daiki had been months ago when he first woke up with his system after being murdered by those rock hampers. The him of back then could have at least taken two or three of these guys. That left only the main instigator that was after the hero water, and Daiki juked to the side, allowing a kanai to pass through the space where his head had been and spun, lashing out with his forearm behind him, just in time to catch and block a powerful punch aimed at his kidney. Miss me, kid? the gray-haired leader in the muscle shirt cackled. He gave a shout and thrust more force into his fist, trying to overpower Daiki's blocked. It didn't work out for him. Not like it had for him earlier when he could leverage his greater strength and reach against Sasuke. Daiki was not only taller than Sasuke, but far stockier and far physically stronger as well. Locking him down, Daiki summoned his tanto into his free hand and swung at the man's head, making him yelp and jump backwards, Man, that was close. You're a strong one, ain't ya? The man laughed before shrugging, unconcerned. Oh well, that's why you make backup plans after all. What? A tight pressure on his wrist made him look down, 
and his eyes widened to see a thick, watery rope wrapped around his wrist, leading straight to the gray-haired rain ninja's hand. Water style, he growled in realization. He swung his tanto over the head to cut through it, but as he did, he felt a presence rush him from behind and quickly changed his swing, directing it into a stab directly behind him. Oh my! A purring female voice gasped slightly in surprise, in his peripheral. He caught sight of a pretty, brown-haired woman dressed in a pair of tight spats, and kimono top that hung open at her shoulders, bearing her chest, only hidden by a tight crop top that kept her melons from being in clear view. She jumped backwards, but as she did, Daiki felt another tight pressure on his wrists, and then his arms were pulled from both sides, jerking them out and stretching him out so hard it felt like his arms were moments away from being pulled out of their sockets. Hee hee, what a big fishy we caught here. At his aim, the gray-haired rain jerk cackled once more. A shame too, he is quite the robust build, does he not? The kunoichi, his aim appeared, giggled flirtatiously. Daiki! Sasuke shouted in worry and began rushing over at a blurring speed. Aha! The Kanasahai called out to him, making a single hand seal and causing electricity to spark around her hands. Get any closer and your tasty and muscular friend here is going to become a light bulb. Sasuke skidded to a stop, a snarl on his lips and his Sharingan Tomo spinning in agitation. Of course, the first good-looking chick to flirt with me would be an enemy. Daiki groused ignoring the pain coming from his arms as best he could. Just his luck as per usual. If only that jerk Kakashi had helped him get the chakra flow technique down. He could just run pure lightning chakra through these damn water whips binding his arms and light these fools up. That left him with only one option. The fools had left his palms exposed to the air. This was gonna hurt like hell, though with his arms pulled out this wide and the force, Daiki grit his teeth and braced himself, then he channeled as much chakra into his seals as they could muster. Force palm jutsu, he roared. He wanted them to know exactly what killed them. He twisted on his feet as he unleashed it, and a pair of surprised shouts left the two ninja binding him as the pure force behind the jutsu he unleashed from his palms as he jerked his arms, bodily lifted them up and dragged them through the air like a pair of rag dolls. Agonizing pain ran down from Daiki's shoulders as his arms were dislocated, but he powered through, a savage smile spreading across his face as he completed his rotation and found the terrified face of his aim soaring towards him, while her cackling buddy sword right passed her through the air towards Sasuke. Forcing himself to ignore the pain, Daiki thrust both arms out and caught the woman right in the solar plexus. Begone thought. He spat, and once more unleashed what was rapidly becoming his signature technique. The air shook from the sheer force of the impact that roared through the woman's stomach, as he unleashed the force palm jutsu at point-blank rage. She gagged, not even able to scream, a deluge of blood erupting from her throat, eyes rolling up into the back of her head, and was summarily shot flying back through the air from the way she came. Crap! Daiki roared as white-hot agony, beyond the agony he felt before, lanced down his arms. The impact reflected at him from his jutsu, had forced his arms back into their sockets and holy freaking crap did it freaking hurt. Ah! Daiki groaned, slumping to his knees. The sound of a body hitting the ground drew his attention, and he looked over to see Sasuke hilting his kanai in the throat of Cackle Boy before pulling it out. Daiki, you okay? Sasuke asked, rushing over to help him. Could be better, but I'll be fine, Daiki replied, though he didn't move from his kneeling position and his arms were utterly numb beyond the pain burning throughout them. He'd be able to heal them, but it would be a pain in the ass to do it one by one, and hurt like a biatch in the process. Not to mention, he was dwindling though on chakra. He only had about a quarter left now. Right. Good. You can rest for now then, Sasuke nodded. Those two seem to be the leaders, so we just need to get Naruto and Shibuki and we're done here. No, they weren't actually. The leader of this nonsense and the strongest of them was still around, hiding somewhere, looking to get his hands on the hero water. Daiki opened his mouth to say something, find a way to tell him to keep on his guard, only for his eyes to widen in horror as a tall, burly man with a bandana over his head seemingly materialized from thin air behind Sasuke. Not quite. 
the man stated with a predatory grin on his face. Sasuke's eyes widened, but he didn't have time to react before the man lashed out and punched him in the side. Sasuke gagged, blood erupting from his mouth, before the force of the punch sent him flying through the air, smashing into and through one of the village houses over 50 feet away, making it collapse on him. Sasuke! Daiki shouted in worry, before a snarl of rage at what happened to his maybe semi-friend, and he lunged to his feet, forcing himself to move. The man backhanded him contemptuously before he even got halfway up, smashing him back into the dirt. His cheek flared with pain and stars erupted in his vision. He could already feel a bruise forming from the blow. Before he could even think to do anything or gain his bearings, a fist grasped him by his hair and bodily lifted him up, before his face was brought down into a knee strike. Crunch went his nose as it broke from the blow the force of it actually pushing him back up to his feet as the man let go of his hair. Yet, even then, his legs threatened to buckle beneath him. If only he could use his AR, a fist deposited itself in his chest and Daiki felt his ribs snap under the blow, and then he was soaring through the air, his vision beginning to go dark. Just before his consciousness faded away, he felt a pair of arms wrap around him and the feeling of weightlessness fade away. I've gotcha! A voice echoed in his ears. Who? Darkness claimed him. Consciousness came back to Daiki slowly, with a rousing pain that made him just want to go back to the darkness and not feel anything anymore. Every breath he took, no matter how shallow, sent sharp spikes of pain echoing through him. For a few moments, he just lay where he was, staring up at what appeared to be an oval-shaped, glowing green ceiling. What? Did Kakashi come save me and take care of it all or something? He wondered briefly in a daze. Surely he would have acted after seeing Sasuke take that hit he did? Ignoring the pain that made him want to curl up into a ball and forgot the world existed, Daiki grit his teeth and forced himself to sit up and blinked. He was in a completely sealed off oval shaped room almost egg like even. And he wasn't alone. There was a girl sitting over beside one of the walls peering out from a small hole in it. A familiar girl, petite, with tan skin, darker than his own, athletically built and short exotic mint green hair. Her outfit consisted of a short sleeveless white midriff shirt with fishnet armor underneath, long white armlets, and fishnet shorts with a short white apron skirt over it, while a blue clothed headband was tied around the bicep of her left arm, depicting the symbol Takigekir. She turned just then and looked at him, apparently feeling some form of movement behind her and stared at him blankly, orange eyes blinking oldishly before a wide grin spread across her face. Hey, you're finally awake! Fuchird! Ah, that voice. That was the one he heard before he passed out. Who saved him? To know if you should be up and about actually, you took a hell of a beating from that freak Suean. She plowed on when he didn't respond. But hey, you were kicking major ass out there. You and your pal wiped out those rain ninja easily. And even those two annoying ones, you did them in good. Where? Daiki began to ask, before coughing. A splatter of blood leaving his broken nose and pain erupting from his ribs. Ish, wish I knew some healing jutsu right about now. Fu winced, rubbing the back of her head sheepishly. Well, take it easy, you're safe for now. This is my cocoon jutsu we're inside. As long as we're in here, that guy won't be able to sense us. Oh, that was good. And bad. Because that meant... Kakashi hadn't come in and mopped the main villain up like he was supposed to. Was I wrong? Did he actually just leave Naruto and Sasuke unguarded? Daiki had to resist the urge to swallow heavily, lest his ribs throb in agony again. It was already taking all he had to keep his thoughts centered. Actually, now that he thought about it, didn't Kakashi only learn about the Akatsuki after the Chunin exams from Jiraiya? And there was no way Kakashi could have predicted something like this happening. Like who would? He only left them to clean up some trash before heading home. Who would expect them to get drawn into an attack on an entire shinobi village? Focus. He told himself and looked Fu in the eyes. Cocoon? He made a show of looking thoughtful. Does that make you? The Nanabai Jinchuriki? It was blunt and not skirting the edges at all. But he really didn't have the time to dance around this topic right now. He'd not been taking this seriously at all. He'd let the idea of Kakashi as a safety blanket make him complacent, arrogant in his assured survival. 
Fu froze. Ah, you know about that? The mint-haired girl swallowed heavily herself. Is that, eh, gonna be a problem? She looked almost like a deer staring into headlights. Why would she lock up like that just from as, oh right, Jinchuriki were usually hated by those around them because people were idiots. God, what a waste. If people trained Jinchuriki in the grind properly, they'd all be absolute beasts when it came to combat by the time they were in their teens. Just look at how fast he was progressing with a bootleg healing factor using the mystical palm jutsu. No, nothing like that. Daiki slowly shook his head and gave her what he hoped was a reassuring smile and not a pained grimace. Honestly, wish I was Jinchuriki right about now. That healing factor you guys have would be amazing for me at the moment. I'm all for Team Bijou right now. Fu just stared at him for a moment, before giggling. It is pretty helpful now and then, she nodded. Though, not that the Nanabai shares much with me, besides these. Suddenly, a pair of insectoid wings emerged from her lower back and flapped rapidly, lifting her up to her feet. Useful, he noted, before what she said caught on fully. Wait, does that mean you can't use a chakra cloak? Not yet. The bug refuses to let me do it. Doesn't like fighting. Fu shrugged. Says I should just run away and not risk getting killed. I mean, as far as pragmatic survival goes, it's probably right, Daiki sighed. But that was also bad, because having her able to even use the initial form, not even pulling on the tailed cloaks would be a massive help. Erm, how strong are you? How do you measure up to that guy who beat my crap in? Suayan? Fu tilted her head before grinning proudly. And for a moment, hope surged in him. I don't even come close. I'd be lucky to last 15 seconds against him one-on-one -on -one if he was serious. Crap. But then, what was he expecting? Waterfall wasn't exactly known for their powerful jinchuriki, or well, powerful anything. Waterfall was basically treated as a joke, and only really got any recognition because it sat on the border between the land of fire and earth, and worked as a stopgap if those rock fetishists tried to invade fire country. They were more of an overly large outpost than a real ninja village to be honest. Their population was less than 2,000. Well, 10 seconds would still be a big help I guess. Daiki tried to be hopeful. Actually, do you know what happened to my friends? Fu winced. Ah, yeah about that. She trailed off before pointing at the hole that she was peering out of before. You might want to take a look. He had a feeling he was not going to like this. Ignoring his body protesting even the slightest movements, Daiki dragged himself over to the edge of the glowing green cocoon room and peered out of the hole. He found that they were apparently very high up in the massive tree he'd saw earlier, hidden amongst the thick greenery of the leaves and had a good vantage point directly downwards. He saw the problem immediately. 1. Sasuke was beaten quite badly and hanging, tied up from a large red tori gate, while to the side, a huge rectangular barrier of some kind, with large earth stakes on each corner, held tens of dozens, no rather multiple hundreds of people all tied up and squished together in there. A flash of pink caught his eyes, and he saw at the very front of the barrier was Sakura, tied up alongside Shizuku and the little boy whose name he hadn't caught that was with them, her mother, laying tied up and unconscious next to them. Freaking hell. Seriously, Sakura? Daiki resisted the urge to groan. He hadn't put much thought into leaving her behind, because they'd killed all the shinobi bar the cackling idiot before heading off. Yet, she'd still somehow managed to get herself captured? Crap, just crap. At least Naruto and Shibuki seemed to be still free out there. If he remembered right, they should be somewhere within the same vicinity as them in amongst this tree. Though, considering the sheer size of it, that wasn't saying much. His eyes drifted to directly outside the barrier, at the front where a familiar man sat on a rock, arms crossed, wild spiky black hair with a bandana over it. The crap head who beat the crap out of him. His vague memories of the movie told him that barrier thing was totally new. And somehow, he seemed far more powerful than he was in the movie, even without the hero's water. There was no way Naruto, even with the initial chakra cloak, could beat this guy. He doubted he'd even be able to with the full one-tail cloak, actually. Daiki grimaced, turning away from the hole and slowly bringing his hands up. It was painstaking, both literally and figuratively, in the scope of speed he could make one single hand seal. Yeah, luckily he hasn't killed your friends, Fu pointed out optimistically as green chakra blossomed out of his hands. Unluckily, 
He's holding them hostage to get Shibuki to come out and give him the hero water, at which point, he'll drink it, get way stronger and slaughter us all anyway. Daiki seriously wished he never agreed to come on this missions. B-rank mission my ass. He pressed his hands to his chest and spread the healing chakra of his jutsu through into his ribs and directed the rest through his arms. He didn't have enough in the tank to heal himself fully, especially if he still wanted to be able to fight. But as long as he could at least move without being in pain and get some speed back in his arms, he could do something. So healing jutsu, huh? You're pretty good. Fu praised him. I had trouble with those two with the whips earlier, but you took them out in less than a minute, so you're strong on top of being able to heal. Kanoha ninja are something else. I'm just built different. Daiki couldn't resist the urge to brag a little bit to the pretty girl with him. So, while I'm healing myself a bit, have you got any plans for dealing with that guy? Not really. She gave him a sheepish smile. I've really not got anything with the fire power to bring him down. I have one that could startle him a bit though and give you an opening. Alright, he could work with that. That'll do. Daiki nodded. Keep him in place for a couple seconds, and I'll hit him with my strongest jutsu. Jonin or not, he wasn't going to be shaking off a B-rank lightning jutsu without being messed up. Gotcha. Fu grinned happily. I'll lay him up. You knock him down. You? She started strong, before trailing off as she realized. She didn't know his name. Daiki. He introduced himself. Daiki. Great name. She beamed. And I'm Fu. Pleased to meet Cha. Like all great plans, they one they came up with just a few minutes ago and were preparing to put in place didn't survive contact with the enemy. Or rather, it didn't even get to come into contact with the enemy at all. Shibuki. Suayan's voice roared loudly, followed by a sharp, feminine squeal of pain. I'm tired of waiting you little coward. Bring out the hero water now. For every minute you don't. I'll be killing one of these pieces of trash I've caught. Starting with this little biatch. Daiki cut off the flow of green chakra, he was spreading through himself and looked through the hole to get a look, and his eyes widened. The feminine squeal. It had been Shizuku. Ah, that guy. Fu's face pressed against his as she leaned over his shoulder and stared through it with him. Her petite, soft chest pressing into his back. Yet he couldn't enjoy it at all. He's really rotten to the core. Threatening civilians. Kids at that. Daiki grimaced. Hands clenched into fists. If only his arms hadn't been messed up earlier, they could have acted sooner. Now, if they put their plan in motion, Shizuku would be swept up in his jutsu and die in agony. It may have been hypocritical of him, since he planned on taking the eyes of another child, but he couldn't find it in him to be pragmatic enough to reap the life of that little girl who affectionately called him Nichon, and who chose him first out of everyone else to seek comfort in when she was scared. What should we do? Fu asked grimacing. He barely even noticed the feeling of her warm cheek rubbing against his to be honest. His mind was rushing a mile a minute, no a second. He had three options here. 1. Let this guy kill Shizuku and others, use the time to heal himself a bit more to make sure he was in as best condition as he could be. 2. Take advantage right now with his hands full and put the plan into motion with his hands full, he'd be even harder pressed to react at all. 3. Waste their plan and save Shizuku instead of killing him when they had the chance. Fudge it. I'm no little biatch. Daiki growled, forcing himself to his feet. He'd already died once or twice actually. He wasn't afraid to go for round three with the Shinigami. It was all or nothing. Even if he went out here and now, he was going to at least make sure he saved Shizuku and make that son of a biatch work for it. And if he was really lucky... The rage over his death would let Fu or Naruto rage mode into their chakra cloaks, and they could tear him apart. Open it up, let's do it. He ordered Fu, already beginning to focus his chakra. Fu stared at him for a moment, before standing up beside him from where she remained kneeling at the hole, and smiling brightly at him. Yeah, let's do it, she agreed. She held her hand in a seal, and a split moment later, the cocoon dissolved from around them, leaving them to free fall from where it was stuck to the bottom of a huge branch. Fu whipped ahead of him with her buzzing wings, shooting down through the air and running through a series of quick hand seals, then opened her mouth and spewed forth a whirlwind of glittering powder that rained down from above. 
A startled shout left Suean's mouth as she powder danced down over his form. Foo! He roared angrily, tightening his grip around Shizuka's neck, making her eyes widen with pain as her windpipe was crushed. Growling, Daiki kicked off of the tree and exploded downwards in the fastest shunshin he'd ever used. He summoned his tanto to his hand for accuracy, and as he came down he aimed straight for the jonin's skull to pierce it from above. He juked to the side and just avoided it, the sleeve on his arm ripping as his blade slashed into it and drew blood, and Daiki impacted the ground hard enough to make a crater beneath himself. The man countered instantly, his foot lashing out with a blindingly fast roundhouse. Daiki didn't even attempt to dodge, he took it straight on in the chest. He felt his ribs, only barely mended, snap under the blow once again and a roar of agony left him, but he pushed on regardless. He slapped his hand, not holding his tanto onto the man's ankle, and unleashed the force palm jutsu. His arm bones felt like they were turning to powder. A shockwave erupted and spread through his kicking leg and the man shouted in pain, Little crap! He spat, eyes closed over and summarily, let go of Shizuku. Daiki caught her in the hand he unleashed his jutsu with, wrapping his arm around her and jumping back, while at the same time tossing his tanto towards Sasuke. The blade pierced through the rope binding him, letting the Uchiha drop to his feet below the Tori gate he was dangling from before. Daiki! The Uchiha grinned at him and leapt over. As he did, he noticed Sasuke's nose was broken as well, his face covered in blood and deep bruising. A second later, Fu landed on the other side of him, opposite Sasuke. He gave them both a nod and looked down to Shizuku who was trembling in his grip. Daiki and Aichan? she whimpered. Doing his best to ignore his painfully protesting body, Daiki gently sat her down and pat her head. You're safe now, he told her, before quickly pushing her towards the Tori gate that led to inside the massive tree. Go hide in there. Quickly, this is going to get dangerous. Thankfully, she was a smart girl and did as told, quickly running inside to hide. Suayan thankfully ignored her. Instead, the man, eyes bloodshot and glaring bloody daggers at them, was standing a good fifty feet away, rubbing at his ankle. You know what? I'm going to enjoy crushing your skull between my palms, you little brat. He huffed, before grinning as he set his foot back on the ground. This works out even better though, right Shibuki? How do you think Kanoha will like to find out some of their precious little kitty shinobi got killed here? Or how about I snap the snack of this little failed weapon? You better be quick, boy. If you don't, I why? Will you shut the hell up already? Daiki snarled. Nobody cares about your grandstanding, you washed up old piece of crap. Yeah, what he said. Fu flashed the jonin the middle finger with. Sasuke merely smirked, crossing his arms and nodding in agreement. Suean snarled. Uppity little brats, he spat. He twisted his foot behind him and was about to rush them when a hail of kunai and shuriken fell through the air above him, aiming for his head. Titch! The man clicked his tongue, jumping back to avoid them, and all eyes were drawn up to the trees, where a familiar orange-clad blonde stood a hundred feet above on a branch, arms crossed and a smirk on his face. Heh! <laughs> Looks to me dash the blonde began, hopping off the branch and shooting down towards him, his hands flashing into a cross-shaped hand seal. That you're outnumbered old man! There was a series of puffs of smoke around Naruto, and suddenly where there was one blonde shooting down through the air, now where was over 30. Annoyances every dash Suean tried to complain, but Daiki took advantage of the distraction, arms shooting up. He unleashed every single weapon he had in his Dimension Force seal, multiple dozens of kanai, shuriken and swords blitzing through the air towards the jonin faster than bullets. At his side, both Sasuke and Fu ran through hand seals. Fire style, dragon fire jutsu, wind style, great breakthrough. Sasuke spat out a massive roaring dragon of flames, while Fu unleashed a powerful gale force wind that could uproot trees from her hands. Eh? The mint-haired girl made a sound of shock as her wind slammed into Sasuke's attack, and the roaring dragon of flame utterly ballooned in size to dwarfing proportions. With Naruto coming from above and all around, his series of weapons and Sasuke and Fu's unintentional combo jutsu, they really do go all out. Suean may have been faster and stronger than all of them, 
but even that only went so far when he was surrounded on basically all sides. Naruto's clones rushed him lashing out with a series of bone-crunching punches and kicks from all sides, while his weapons and the raging flame dragon swept over the enemy Jonin. They were silent, the only noise being the crackling flame of the inferno that was burning into Suean's position and Naruto hopping away from the fire, clutching his smoking bottom. Hot! 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 The blonde yelped, slapping his own ass to put out small embers that were burning into his backside. Can't you watch your aim, you jackass? He spat at Sasuke when he finished. How about you not get in the way of my jutsu idiot? Sasuke shot back. Heh. You guys are a riot. Fu laughed heartedly, before crossing her arms behind her head. Man, that was easier than I thought it was going to be. Daiki frowned. It was, but something was off. He didn't sense the guy escaping the attack at all. Actually, in the end, he didn't even try from the brief glimpse he got before the attack slammed into his position. But what was even more off-putting, where was that familiar death wail of agony that usually happened when somebody burned to death? Or where was the scent of crispy fried human flesh? Wait, something's WR dash he never got to finish, because abruptly, a massive amount of steam began to emit from the fire and it rapidly dwindled down, to reveal Suean but wholly different. He was wrapped from head to toe in a churning armor of pure water. I can't believe I have to use my ultimate jutsu against a bunch of weak brats because I wasn't taking you all seriously. The jonin spat angrily, before shaking his head. No matter, it's simple. Now that you've seen my water armor, you just have to die. He lifted his hand as he finished, and punched out with a simple jab. From that jab, a gigantic fist of purely compressed water shot through the air towards them. Not unlike a huge bijou chakra claw. It was absolutely gargantuan and, despite its size, shockingly fast. Only Fu had anywhere to run with something this size. On instinct, Daiki launched himself into the air, forward to meet it and slammed both palms into the jutsu, pumping all the chakra he had left. That wouldn't kill him into his force palm jutsu. The concentrated shockwave that blasted from his hands tore right though it, leaving the jutsu to collapse apart like a pair of splitting waves. His eyes widened immediately after though, as Suean appeared in the shadow of his jutsu. So fast Daiki didn't even see him move, and he couldn't do anything as the water and shrouded hand wrapped around his neck and thrust down. His back slammed into the ground a split moment later, hard enough to crater it inwards and his spine erupted into agony. Then choked as the hand tightened around his windpipe and the man began strangling him to death, with Daiki helpless to do anything else. Daiki! He heard someone shout. He couldn't tell who. Everything was going dark. His eyes rolled up and he could just make out Sasuke, Naruto, and Fu rushing to help him. But the man choking the life out of him, lifting his other and with a snort, and from his fingers erupted massive pillars of water that slammed into the three of them and subsumed them, carrying them out of sight. Bastard. Daiki used all the remaining mental faculties he had to curse the man in his head. For a brief moment, his gaze drifted up and he may have been hallucinating as he neared death, because, for a brief second, he thought he caught sight of Kakashi running through a rapid set of blurring hand seals, but then he was just gone. Enough sensei! A sudden voice bellowed out in a rage, and he felt the fingers around his throat ease up, allowing him to suck in great big gasps of air and fill his lungs. Heh! <laughs> Suean snorted, completely forgetting about Daiki and letting him go, turning towards the lake. So you finally crawled out of your hiding spot, you little spineless coward? He spat. Coughing and hacking, Daiki feebly turned on his side and looked to the lake. And there, it was Shibuki. But, completely different from before. He held an oddly shaped glass bottle in one hand. Filled with a mysterious looking liquid. It was like water, but silvery instead of clear. And, there was a massive raging aura of chakra blazing around Shibuki's body. So powerful and tangible the very air seemed to roil and twist. A powerful seething aura of chakra that reminded Daiki of a bijou chakra cloak almost. And his eyes so different from the shaky, cowardly things from earlier. A blazing rage stood out in them now as he glared bloody murder at Suean. You, you're right of course, but I can't stand aside anymore. I wonder, is this how my father felt back then? I finally understand. Shibuki trailed before, before snarling, 
I'm your opponent now, Sensei. As soon as he said so, the water he was standing on erupted into a massive geyser. It wasn't a jutsu, but from the sheer speed and force Shibuki erupted forward, closing the distance between him and his former sensei in the blink of an eye. Suayan only had the barest of moments to bring his arms up to block the sudden punch. Yet, even with his armor, the sheer force behind it lifted him up and sent him flying back like a missile. Yet, even as he flew back so fast Daiki could barely see him, a massive of water tentacles erupted from his water-clad body, each compressing into spiked ends and lashing down at Shibuki. Daiki's eyes widened when he noticed one coming right for him as well. He couldn't move. He feebly pushed himself up before collapsing again. Shibuki clicked his tongue. Rapidly he appeared beside Daiki and ran through a few hand seals, the bottle of water dropping from his grip, before opening his mouth and spewing out what was almost a literal tidal wave in scope. It was so huge it blocked everything out of view for Daiki. Holy crap. He gaped. The hero water was freaking insane. Suddenly, the tidal wave was swept aside and Suayan's laughter echoed. Using water against me when I have my water armor. You never learn, you twit. He mocked. Suddenly appearing in front of Shibuki in a blur of speed Daiki couldn't keep up with at all. Shibuki caught a punch and retaliated with one of his own, only to have to quickly retreat back as from dozens of water spikes erupted from the missing ninja's body attempting to pierce Shibuki. Shibuki snarled, forming a single hand seal, and then thrust his hand out, grasping a massive sword of compressed water and rushing at his sensei. Who did the exact same? Daiki could only watch helplessly as they engaged in a terrifying fast, zipping battle of taijutsu and sword strikes, and he could barely follow it at all. But as it continued on, he noticed. The roaring chakra shroud around Shibuki was getting smaller and smaller, and bit by bit, Shibuki became slower and weaker, his sensei beginning to overpower him as the difference in their base's abilities became utterly apparent. Crap! Crap! Daiki looked behind him to his companions only to find all three of them laid out in a trio of craters, unconscious. They hadn't just been crushed and subsumed by his earlier attack, they'd been drowned into unconscious while at it. Probably once they were slammed back into the ground and forced to breath because of the stun that came from the impact. He can't last much longer, Daiki realized. And once Shibuki fell, it was all over, that guy would kill them all and get the hero water as he wanted. Daiki didn't even know why the freaking idiot wanted it. He should know using it would take a chunk of his life force. Even a sip from it, while it would Daiki's power massively, it would only last a minute or two at most, and it would take a good ten years off of his lifespan. Though ten years instead of his life would be a good trade-off at this point. His eyes drifted to the bottle of hero water laying innocent beside him and temptation flared. Fudge it, he would die anyway at this rate. And big deal, he'd die at like a hundred instead of a hundred and ten or something, if somebody didn't murder his ass first anyway. Reaching out with a shaky arm, Daiki grabbed the bottle. He was so weak though, that he had to struggle to just pop the cork off of it and open it. To the grind. He snorted to himself, before holding it up to his lips and taking a sip. He swallowed, and then, everything went still. The haze of darkness around his vision cleared up. His senses spread out massively. His eyesight sharpened, the pain that had been plaguing him faded away, and Daiki stood once more. A rushing sensation ran through his veins, and he felt his chakra click, and like a flame fed barrels and barrels of oil. It ignited, it exploded, it grew, it consumed and it freaking roared. A massive aura of chakra erupted from his tenketsu, and for this moment, Daiki felt it. Power. This was the feeling of strength, for this moment, he could feel it in his veins, he was standing before the line, that when breached, allowed one to grasp the power of Akage. His gaze snapped over towards Shibuki as the air shook as they clashed water swords, and he noticed, Shibuki being pushed to his knees now by his sensei, the flame of chakra that was once an inferno around his form, now but a glittering haze of dwindling embers. Daiki popped the cork back in the bottle and lowered it. Then he moved. The ground cracked and cratered under his feet. He could barely control his own newly enhanced strength and speed. What seemed like an instant later, he was at Suayan's side, 
thrusting his palms out and unleashing his jutsu. The air boomed as if the sky roared with thunder, and twin shock waves erupted from his palms with such force that the air in front of him seemed to crack and shimmer. Suayan roared in agony, yet over it, Daiki heard as his ribs went snap under the force that transmitted through his water armor. And a split moment later, he shot through the air like a cannonball, shooting straight over the of hundreds of feet to the other side of the lake, smashing into and through a series of houses. Oops. You? Shibuki gaped at him, just as the chakra fully dwindled from around him. You drank it? He trailed off, before his eyes shut and he fell unconscious. If he didn't finish this quickly, that was what would happen to him. Daiki caught him before he fell into the water. In a blur of pure speed, he carried the older shinobi back to the island with the huge tree and sent him down. Then he rushed over the lake in a blur with Shunshin, moving so fast it was almost mind-boggling to Daiki. He must have been moving over ten times as fast as he could. He landed on the other shore a split few seconds later. Just as his enemy erupted from the debris of buildings, it had taken him a good nearly ten or so seconds to recover from Daiki's surprise attack. If not for that water armor, he would have likely been killed right then and there as the force palm jutsu pulverized him from the inside out and crushed his organs. You! I should have snapped your damn neck the second I got my hands on you earlier! Suayan spat, before rushing him, water erupting from his feet and propelling him forward. It was funny. Just a little bit ago, he couldn't even see this guy moving. Yet, so slow, Daiki shook his head as he easily tilted his head to the side, avoiding a punch tipped with a lance of water, then hopped over a sweeping kick that unleashed a blade of water that less than a minute ago would have cut his legs off before he could see it coming. So goddamn slow. Was this what it felt like to be Kakashi against a scrub, he wondered? Shut you, you dash Suan began to roar in a rage only to be immediately shut up as Daiki's palm slammed into and through the water armor around his face and grasped him by the skull with bone-crushing force. Hey! Daiki could feel the bloodlust building up within him now that the shoe was on the other foot. How about I thank you for your treatment of me earlier? And how you tried to kill Shizuku while using her as a hostage? The water armor around the man roiled and raged like ocean waves. He could see almost in slow motion as dozens upon dozens of spikes began forming intending to impale him. Daiki unleashed a force palm jutsu at point-blank rage. Right into the man's face the forming water spikes flopped apart. The water armor didn't dissipate. He was still alive. The water armor must have blunted enough of it for him to live. No matter. Daiki smirked. He lifted the man by his skull and brought his free hand up forcing it through the water and placing it against his stomach. Then he fired off a pair of force palm jutsu. Then again. Then again. And again. Over and over in a rapid fire, he unleashed his own original and created jutsu in a barrage. The water armor dissipated by the second time. He didn't care. He wanted his goddamn pound of flesh for him forcing him to go this freaking far. When he finally stopped and dropped the corpse of the former Jonin to the ground, the face was entirely gone, and there was a gaping hole ripped straight through the stomach to the other side. In the end, the man had become nothing more than a bloody pulped piece of meat. Fay! Daiki spat on the corpse. He would have loved to beat the man around a little more, take out his frustration and rage on him. But he wasn't consumed by the desire enough to not notice the way his strength and chakra, despite peaking so massively, begun to rapidly dwindle as the seconds went by. Before he lost the boost to his chakra, and the proper feeling swept through him again, Daiki brought his hands together into a single modified seal, pure bright green chakra erupting from his hands. Daiki took the chance to mend all of his injuries, right up until his vision went dark, and his legs buckled beneath him. He never hit the ground, a hand caught him before he did. Ma, you're a real scary kid, huh? A familiar, annoying voice drawled. I freaking hate you. Daiki cursed him. Then he faded into unconsciousness. This time, when consciousness returned to Daiki, it was a gentle thing like he just woke up from a really good nap. And he felt good. Awake almost instantly, as soon as he opened his eyes. He pushed himself up and realized he was actually in a bed. A pretty nice bed actually, way better than the one in his crappy apartment. He looked around, 
noting he was in a rather barren-looking room with a particular type of wooden walling and flooring, looking exactly like the wood made to build the houses in the waterfall village. Daiki smirked, feeling a surge of pride flow through him as he remembered the state he left that prick Suean in. Giving himself a mental pat on the back, he leaned back against the comfortable pillow that he had been laying on and just basked in the feeling of victory now that he was awake to enjoy. Oh yeah, been a while since I checked my stats. He mused, idly calling up his status. Eh? He blinked stupidly at what was reflected back at him. That didn't make sense. Not at all. Name? Daiki Yurii Age. 13. Chakra Capacity. 39. 600 slash 39. 600. Chunin. Strength. 86.4 slash 510. Endurance. 128.4 out of 510. Durability. 86.4 slash 510. Agility. 86.4 out of 510. Taijutsu. 155 out of 500. Ninjutsu. 174 slash 500. Jinjutsu. 10 out of 500. Bukijutsu. 46 slash 500. Chakra control. 182 out of 500. Chakra affinities. Lightning. Adept you have stepped onto the path of roaring thunder. Fuinjutsu. Adept you are no longer a mere amateur. What the utter crap. His chakra capacity it had more than doubled since he last saw it. Not only that, but all of his physical abilities they had risen drastically. But beyond even that, his physical stats. The cap on them had been 500 before. But now, it was 510. That didn't seem like a big gap. But he'd noticed something before. Going by his stat numbers, he should only be roughly four times as strong as he was right now, as he was when he first woke up with this status system. But that was wrong. By his estimates, he was actually double that amount stronger and definitely that amount faster. The higher his stats rose, the harder it became to make them rise. Yet at the same time, each single stat pot seemed to bit by bit become worth more than the one before it. 30 wasn't half as strong as 60 in these numbers. Not even close. He actually couldn't tell how big the gaps were. It was really hard to measure. The difference between 500 and 510 was probably quite massive when applying that logic. Is it because of the hero water? He wondered, dismissing the status screen and thinking. Thinking on it, this... This was probably a good thing. Considering the amount of time he'd need to make these kinds of gains, weeks, more even, for a paltry ten years off of his life? Yes, Daiki decided this well worth it. After all, making up for ten years of life force? That would be easy. After all, he was planning on becoming a Jinshiriki. And beyond that, there was a certain little ferret with a certain little traveling clan from another continent, roaming the elemental nations. And in that ferret, there was a certain stone that he could easily get his hands on. He only needed a fragment of it even and could give the rest back to the ferret, and not only would it boost all of his abilities and chakra, it would also massively increase his lifespan. Guess I gotta look into finding the Stone of Jellal. He mused, he should probably start with the Land of Rivers. Everything freaking else was there after all. Shifting the covers laying neatly across his body off, Daiki sat up fully and pushed himself up out of the bed. Honestly, he was feeling pretty damn energized right now. He was almost itching to burn off energy now that he'd sorted his thoughts out. He was eager to get back to the grind. And something else now plagued him as he remembered back to that fight. He was more or less a gnat compared to Suean, as expected of a rookie genin fighting a jonin. Yet, with just a sip of the hero's water, he'd absolutely crushed the man easily even with such an astounding technique as that water armor of his. The man was probably on, or at least approaching the level of an elite jonin, definitely at least bordering on the ability of an A-rank shinobi. Daiki clenched his hands. A wide grin spread across his face. He drifted back to the feeling of complete power, the pure confidence and high he felt. It was like nothing he'd ever experienced before. He wanted it. He wanted to reach that level, become that strong, and then grind even further upwards and ascend even further beyond. He knew after all that the level of strength he'd gained from there was but a pittance compared to the kind of strength the likes of Madara and Hashirama had, hell, he bet it didn't even come close to comparing to the likes of the Reikijai and the like. 
Yeah, that's it. I'll get there S-dash. He lifted his hand into the air and began to make a vow to grow that strong. Only for the door to swing open and Fu to step in, and pause, blinking her orange eyes oulishly. Hey, you're awake again, Daiki. The mint-haired Jinchuriki beamed. Then her eyes drifted down from his face, to his crotch and her cheeks flushed a bit red. And it was then Daiki realized he was completely naked. I blame Kakashi. He growled mentally. Name... Daiki Yurii with Hero Water Drank, Chakra Capacity. 194-000-194-000 Strength. 357-500 Endurance. 105.6-500 Durability. 357-500 Agility. 357-500 For a moment, they just stared. Daiki at the Mint Hair Jinchuriki and Fu eyeing up his Serpent King Manda. Sure, the size difference in the naming sense was a bit off and didn't fit, but hey, Manda was the biggest serpentine beast he could think of right now, even if he was too minuscule to truly describe his manly girth. Daiki sighed. Take a picture, it'll last longer. He deadpanned. Fu yoinked her gaze from his crotch and shrugged. I don't have a camera, she replied. Can I borrow yours? I don't have one either. Daiki found himself retorting, Maybe Shibuki? She tapped her chin and mused. She sure wasn't shy at all. Huh? Shaking his head, Daiki ignored his state of undress and crossed his arms. So what happened after I passed out? He asked. Fu clicked her tongue. Don't know. I didn't wake up until like an hour after you had apparently beaten that prick head. She pouted. I can't believe I got taken out so easily. Then missed Shibuki kicking ass and then you were finishing him off. Must have been an amazing show. Her shoulders slumped. You know, it's been a long time since Shibuki was like that. He used to be way cooler than he is now. She shook her head, before perking up. Anyway, your friends have already recovered and left, but your sensei has stuck around to wait for you to wake up. Daiki gave her an odd look. Shibuki, cool? Well, Daiki supposed he was kind of cool yesterday when he finally manned up, but beyond that, he couldn't picture the man as cool at all. And what was that about his sensei? I don't have a sensei, Daiki pointed out. Actually, how long have I been out? Fu shrugged. Well, the scarecrow-looking gray-haired jonin guy is waiting for you at Shibuki's place. She corrected herself. And, about a day I guess? Not that long considering the beating you took and the fact you drank the hero's water. Actually, how are you feeling? She was a bit of a motor mouth, wasn't she? But, hmm? Kakashi stuck around? That didn't sound like him. Daiki flexed his rippling biceps from his crossed arms and gave her a smirk. I feel good. Great even. He said, How about you? In reply, Fu pumped her fist up. I'm fine. I didn't take anywhere near as big a beating as you did. And I recover quick anyway. One of the benefits of being a Jinchuriki. Right? Good to hear. Daiki nodded before a thought occurred. Actually... How is that treating you here? Like, the QB Jinchuriki is treated like crap back in my village. Fu blinked, before her bright smile turned a little shaky. Erm. I mean, it's not that bad. You know? Shibuki always looked out for me growing up, before his dad died at least and he turned out the way he did. And well, I'm not really close to anyone else, they're wary of me, but they don't exactly treat me bad or anything. She didn't even hesitate to explain to him had he endeared himself to her that much already. Or was it more likely she just had no filter? Wait, you know the QB Jinchuriki? She suddenly asked, eyes widening as she caught on to that fact. Yeah, and so do you, Daiki pointed out. Or probably, you know the blonde kid, Naruto? He's got the QB. Eh? Fu gaped. I talked to him a bit yesterday before he left. Though he was more interested in the pink-haired girl, I had no idea. Ah, that sucks. I've never talked to another Jinchuriki before. Oh wait. Crap. Wasn't it supposed to be an S-Class secret or something like that? Fudge. Well, not like anybody had told him it was an S-Class secret. He only knew from meta-knowledge, so not like he could be blamed for it. You should keep that to yourself, mind you. Daiki tacked on, just in case. It's supposed to be some sort of secret, despite how badly it's hidden. So if you talk about it, you might get my head chopped off. Fu blinked, before grinning. Ah, don't worry about it. 
I won't tell anybody. I promise. I'm just glad I got to meet another container like me. She waved him off. It's almost like being proper comrades in a way. Close to being's friends, I don't really have any friends, so it's nice to know. Oh, right. Daiki had to hold back a grimace. From what he remembered, wasn't Fu so lonely in canon, without any friends, that she actually allowed the Akatsuki to take her because she felt no joy in life. Suddenly, he could quite easily picture this girl, floating in a shroud of chakra in a dark cave, surrounded by nine shadowy figures as they extracted the beast from within her out, leaving her in a state of agony for days on end. Before they finished and she finally died, her corpse, treated like trash, just left to drop to the ground and left to rot. His hand gripped his bicep and tightened, almost hard enough to draw blood. Aren't we friends? Daiki found himself saying on instinct. Fu's eyes widened. We're friends? She replied slowly, a forlorn something in her voice that tugged at his heartstrings. Fudge, he was such a sap. We hit it off, didn't we? You saved my life and then we fought side by side as well. Daiki shrugged. As far as I'm concerned, I think that's enough to start off a friendship between us. A second later he had his arms full of a petite, toned kunoichi as she slammed into him, arms wrapping around him, and he heard a brief sniffle before it was drowned out by her voice in his ear. Friends, huh? That's great. I've never had a friend before. She cheered. Yes, though he should probably point out, friends didn't quite hug each other while one was completely nude especially not when one was an exotically cute girl. Not unless they were friends with benefits or the friends beyond friends, the relationship kind. But Fu wouldn't exactly understand that type of things right now, he didn't think. My little Daiki is pressing against her stomach. Daiki mused. It took all the iron willpower he'd formed through throwing himself into the grind for months on end to stop his Serpent King Manda from entering Serpent King Manda Sage Mode. Her Ryuchi cave was off-limits for now. It took him a not inconsiderable amount of time to extract himself from Fu's hug. And thankfully, it turned out his clothes were just sitting in a corner of the room, in a haphazard pile. Kakashi was such a jerk sometimes. He wasted no time on pulling his clothing back on. While he wasn't really ashamed at all to be naked, it was hard to keep from going full bonorific sometimes, so better safe than sorry. He didn't want to give Fu the wrong idea. You know what sucks? Fu mused as he finished dressing. Sitting on the bed he'd awoken in and kicking her feet back and forth. He made an effort not to stare at her lovely, toned legs. It was hard. Fu had all the looks of an Arabian girl. And a pair of hips that just did not quit. She would look amazing in a belly dancer outfit. A lot of things. Daiki griped. Sitting beside her now that he was done. She chuckled. Well, yeah, she nodded, but hear me out here. You're my first friend, and I won't be able to see you much, especially since you need to leave soon because you're on a mission. It's not like we can't visit each other, he pointed out in return. Our villages are allied, so you can come to Kanoha whenever and I don't think Shibuki will mind at this point if I pop over here to visit you either since I already know the entrance of the place. Fu sighed, collapsed back onto her back on the bed. If only... I'm not actually allowed to leave the village, being a Jinshiriki and all, she pouted. So, it'll have to be you visiting me alone, and well, you've got your own training to do as a shinobi and missions and stuff to do, you know? Well, exuberant she might be, but she clearly wasn't an idiot. He didn't actually have a lot of time between training and missions. Well, there's a lot of things I want to take care of outside my village, Daiki mused. I can always pop by and visit when I'm doing that and the Chunin exams are in just two months. Maybe you can come over to Kanoha then and we can hang out? She perked up a bit. Did know about the Chunin exams. I asked to go to the last ones, but Shibuki wouldn't let me. She shrugged, but grinned. But the other stuff sounds cool. Hopefully you'll have some fun stories to tell me. Daiki was about to reply. When she suddenly clapped her hands, eyes widening. Oh, I know. Fu grinned widely at him. I can teach you the wave transmission jutsu and we can talk from really far away with it, though. I don't know if you'll have enough chakra for it considering how much distance there is between our villages. Wait, what? You're going to teach me such a useful-sounding jutsu? Just so we can talk over long distances? Daiki blinked slowly. Yup. Fu flashed him a thumbs up. 
but like I said, you might not have enough chakra to use it much, like not even a Jonin would be able to supply enough chakra to hold a full-on conversation considering how far away Kanoha is from here. Jonin tier chakra, huh? And not even manage a full conversation. Quite the chakra guzzler, wasn't it? Not to mention, his chakra capacity had outright doubled and was still in the Chunin range. If there was an elite Chunin tier like there was for Jenin, then he was a ways off from reaching Jonin tier. Let me worry about that. Daiki waved off her worries, he had options after all, then paused as he remembered something. Actually, there's a way you can help me out on that front. Hmm. Fu tilted her head. Sure, whatever you need. She agreed instantly. He should probably caution her after this though, to make sure she doesn't just give a random stranger whatever they want from her just because they said they'd be her friend. Can you show me your seal? He asked, getting straight to the point. Fu's exotic orange eyes looked at him strangely, before she shrugged. Sure, I don't mind, she replied, before promptly turning around so her back was facing him, and pulling her short crop top and mesh up at the front, making it right up and expose her slender back to him, before he could get stuck ogling the suddenly half-naked older girl. Her back shimmered for a moment, chakra palpably running over her skin, and huge black blocks of ink faded into existence. Each one was at a corner of her back, and all four of them perfectly lined up perpendicularly leading to the middle of her back, banishing any of the horny within himself. Daiki focused only on the grind and raised his hand, placing his palm in the middle of the seal and running his chakra through it. As he did, chains of sealing characters spread out from the four ink blocks, forming into a spiderweb like pattern. A for symbol seal, huh? Daiki mused. This was far higher quality than he thought it was going to be. But he could tell at just a glance this was no master's work, so it probably didn't measure up to the four-symbol seal Kushina had, and definitely not the eight-symbol seal made by overlaying two four-symbol seals over each other that Naruto had, even if he hadn't had the chance to examine them. He could tell that right off the bat, because even as low-tier a seal user as he was, he could actually understand quite a bit of this seal matrix. Right? Give me a minute. Daiki said and held his hand out, summoning a blank scroll and some ink from his Dimension Force seal, which felt particularly empty right now. My weapons got destroyed by Sasuke and Fu's Jutsu. He remembered with annoyance, before dismissing the thought and focusing on copying down the seal on Fu's back. After he copied down the seal and sealed the copy in his Dimension Force seal, Fu was eager to teach him her Jutsu. It was a Jutsu that spread out a wave of chakra, almost like sonar waves, on a specific frequency decided on by the users and carried the inner thoughts of the user to their target. All in all, it was basically a jutsu used for talking within your head with another. A very useful tool for a ninja really, when it came to not making any sounds and not letting others overhear your plans. And, from the looks of it, it actually wasn't all that complicated. And according to Fu, he should be able to get it down within a few days of training. When he was done and knew what he had to do to finish learning the technique though, Daiki felt guilty. She gave him a really useful jutsu just to talk with him, and didn't mind at all when it came to showing her seal to him. She didn't know just how much her doing so contributed to his overall goals either. She had sped up his plans immensely. He couldn't leave her without giving her something in return. So he taught her a jutsu of his own in return. Oh wow! The second Fu that had been summoned through a puff of smoke, a half an hour later grinned, both her and the original eagerly looking each other over. This jutsu is so cool! The twin girls exclaimed, turning to grin at him. Best idea ever! Daiki decided then as he bore witness to his spontaneous decision. Especially since both Fu's quickly latched onto his sides and hugged him tightly. They were very touchy-feely and didn't mind at all hugging him. It was hard to be jealous of how easily she learned the technique compared to him, when there were benefits like this. This is so great! Fu beamed at him. Yeah, you said this jutsu can transfer memories, right? Her clone on his other side nodded eagerly in agreement. With this clones like me can head outside of the village and explore and have fun, then send the memories back to the original, you're the best daiki. He supposed they could be used that way as well. Well, happy to help out a friend. He grinned back at them both. Just then, there was a knock on the door, before it swung up, and a familiar Cyclope's face Jonin entered the room. He paused, 
looking over the two foos, before raising an eyebrow at Daiki. Sorry, was I interrupting something? He then wiggled said eyebrow at the teen. Oh, it's you. Daiki's good mood evaporated and his gaze turned dry. Oh, did it suddenly get colder in here? Kakashi hummed, the amusement in his eye plain as day. Anyway, sorry to interrupt your flirting with your new little friend, but now that I see you're awake, Shibuki wants to talk to you before we leave. He explained, before looking down at the book in his hand, as he always did. We weren't flirting, Fu protested, before pausing and looking at Daiki. Were we? Not really, Daiki responded idly. Just ignore Sakashi, he's just projecting because he's a, like a 30-year-old virgin. Hmm. Kakashi looked up from his book boredly. Did you say something? I couldn't tell. I'm just so strong you see that sometimes the voices of the incredibly weak just don't register. Daiki resisted the urge to toss a kunai at the man. It was a close thing though. Mostly because he didn't really have any left, granted. As tempting as it was, to be a petty little crap and blow Kakashi off, Daiki knew he couldn't act so petulant in another village and make Kanoha look bad. So, he reluctantly did as the man said and left the house he had been sleeping off his exhaustion from yesterday in and was directed to another, larger home. Near enough a mansion in comparison to the rest of the homes throughout the village. Fu led him through, while Kakashi stayed outside, his new friend bringing him through the home to an office space, guarded by two shinobi. They both eyed Fu and Daiki for a moment, before ignoring them. Fu ignored them right back and promptly kicked open the door, slamming it into the wall with a loud bang. Hey Shibuki! The girl greeted loudly. Snorting, Daiki followed her inside. He found Shibuki sitting behind a large oak desk, the man looking up from a large scroll, a bunch more of them spread about his desk and piles of documents. Guess even in a minor village the paperwork is killer. Daiki mused, and made a vow to never become Hokage. Shibuki sighed. Fu, how many times have I asked you not to just barge in? He asked, laying the scroll down. Dino never counted. She shrugged. He sighed once more, before looking at Daiki. Thanks for coming to see me before you left. He started, before promptly bowing his head to Daiki. In a rather shocking move that actually surprised the boy. I wanted to thank you personally for your help. If not for you and your friend's kindness and bravery, Waterfall would have fallen yesterday. You in particular went above and beyond, suffering many debilitating injuries from what Fu tells me and then even going on to use the hero water yourself. Whether you knew or not, the fact remains you gave up at least a decade of your life force to help us, so please accept my gratitude. It, it's fine. We're, you know, allies. Daiki trailed off, rather shocked and unable to formulate any other reply. Where the hell had the cocky, haughty coward from yesterday went to? Even the way he spoke, softer, yet at the same time it carried a much heavier weight than it did yesterday. It was the voice of a man, and not a cowardly little boy. It was like he was looking at a completely different person. Thank you for your understanding. Shibuki lifted his head and smiled at him. Still, I've made sure you won't walk away from here empty-handed for your efforts. He reached into his top and procured two scrolls. One, a standard ceiling scroll, while the other was around double the size and on the rim, depicted the image of a large black fish. Shibuki placed both scrolls on his desk. This ceiling scroll contains the bounty we placed on my former teacher, one million Rio in total, he explained, before pointing to the fish-bearing scroll. This though, this is something that was a gift to Suan by my father, due to him being the strongest shinobi in the village beyond my father, it is one of three contract scrolls passed down in my family, for the fish clan. This specific scroll is linked to Renenmaru, one of the boss summons and the personal summon of Suayan. We retrieved the scroll from his body. As a gift, I want you to have it. Ah, uh, well wasn't that something. Renenmaru? Fu spoke up before he could, tapping her chin in thought. Isn't that one just like your summon? Can it like transform into a huge dragon? Yes, all the fish bosses are capable of using the dragon transformation technique. Shibuki nodded. Renenmaru is tied for the strongest of the clan with my own summon, perhaps even stronger nowadays. Though he is known for his particularly aggressive personality, he may just attack you if summoned, especially considering you killed Suan. A million Ryo and a fish that could turn into a dragon. Neat. 
He didn't really need a summoning contract, though he already had one. And he didn't know if signing it would cause issues with the Chameleon Clan. You didn't happen to find the instructions for that water armor jutsu of his, did you? He'd happily take that instead. A dragon summon technically sounded freaking cool as crap, and if it could fly, that would be hella useful, and as a fish originally, it probably had access to water jutsu that would pair well with his lightning jutsu. But that water armor would be a safer bet. Because if it turned out the chameleons weren't cool with him signing another contract, he wasn't going to, so it would be useless to him. Better something he could for sure get use out of himself. Shibuki snorted. Heh. If only... The leader of Waterfall shook his head. It was quite the jutsu, wasn't it? If I could spread that jutsu through the village, we'd definitely be able to grow stronger overall, but sadly, no. Knowing my teacher, selfish as he was, he'd probably have destroyed anything remotely instructional on the technique once he learned it himself. Well, that sucked. Still, it wasn't like what he got was a bad haul or anything. He wondered idly for a moment if this Rainmaru would be able to teach that dragon transformation technique to Shiromari. He had mentioned he was born of a union between the Snake Clan and the Chameleons specifically. His father was actually Manda, in an attempt to breed an actual dragon. Granted, to do that, he would need to summon Shiromari, and he hadn't really gotten around to trying that out yet. He may have enough chakra to do so, but he couldn't exactly do that in another village, now could he? Hmm. Daiki thought of the best option to go with here. His eyes flickered briefly to the girl by his side. That may be a better option actually. If Fu had a boss summon on her own side, she would have a lot more options if Akatsuki ever came calling. And he doubted Fu would begrudge him signing it later if things worked out with the chameleons on that front anyway. So, I can do what I want with this then? Daiki asked, picking the fish contract scroll up. It's yours to do as you please with. Shibuki confirmed. All right then. Daiki nodded, then turned around and held the scroll out to Fu. Here, you have it Fu? Uh? Shibuki trailed off in shock. Really? Fu's eyes widened with excitement. Yeah, I already have a summon contract of my own and I don't know if they'll accept me having another clan's contract as well. He shrugged, before smiling at her. Plus, this Rainmar guy sounds tough, and I'd feel better knowing you have strong backup like that. Yahoo! Fu accepted the scroll and jumped up and down excitedly. I always wanted a summon of my own. She then slammed into his side again, wrapping him in a massive hug. Wait, wait, wait. Shibuki spluttered, standing up abruptly. So fast his chair tipped over and hit the ground with a clatter. Are you sure about this? Rainmaru isn't a weak summon Daiki-san. His scales are so hard normal weaponry can't pierce him. He's faster than Suean was and has many water-style techniques. On top of that, upon assuming his dragon form, he can use fire-style techniques as well. Rainmaru really was impressive. Huh? Really living up to that boss summon title. Yeah, I'm sure of it. Daiki nodded. Though, I hope you don't mind me coming back for a visit now and then to Sifu. Shibuki shook his head and sighed, picking up his chair and sitting back down. Feel free, honestly, if it wasn't due to her status. I'd tell her to go with you in vacation in Kanoha, keep her out of my hair for a while. He replied dryly. Sadly, it's not quite that simple, I do barely keep detesting our borders as is. Simply because it is known she is always stationed here and they fear the wrath of the Nanabai, if they heard she was staying in Kanoha now, especially with how much they hate. Your village? They'd get paranoid and much more aggressive. Daiki growled at the mention of them. Freaking rock hampers. He spat in disgust. They never learn. Okay, so maybe he had a grudge against IWA for the way two freaking grown Jonin had targeted him. A mere rookie Jenin and murdered him just because he was from the leaf. Surprisingly, Shibuki nodded in agreement. Yeah, I'll have to shake the hand of the Yandame Hokage when the day comes that I die. He half smirked at the thought. The only good IWA ninja is a dead one as far as I'm concerned. Oh yeah. Didn't Shibuki's father die because he needed to use the hero water to hold off Anoki? Honestly, suddenly Shibuki seemed much more likable today. He left Shibuki's office not long later, sans Fu. It seemed he wanted to take the time to explain to her that the summoning technique, especially one linked to Rainmaru, was not a toy and she had to be careful with it. Fu had already half-tuned him out as soon as he started, instead focusing on hugging the ever-loving daylights out of Daiki 
and telling him to come back and visit soon and winking at him while wishing him luck on increasing his chakra capacity. Shibuki had sputtered and went bright red at her words. He thought it was innuendo apparently, and didn't coin on to the real meaning behind her words at all. So, ready to go? He found Kakashi leaning on the wall of the mansion beside the door. Are you a clone or the real one? Daiki asked instead. Not a clone, Kakashi shrugged. I left a few clones to keep an eye on you while I escorted my team back, then rushed back once they were back in the village. Daiki shrugged and walked on, the older shinobi pushing off the mansion and quickly catching up and walking beside him in a few strides. I've got another question, he asked. I may have the answer. Kakashi didn't even look up from his book. If you were around, the teen began, narrowing his eyes at the man by his side. Why did you let that guy kick the crap out of us? You could have taken care of him at any point, couldn't you? Actions have consequences, Kakashi shrugged, actually looking up from his book to stare at Daiki seriously. You and those three other idiot chibis jumped right into a mission you were never given. You aren't samurai. It isn't your job to defend the innocent. You're a shinobi. The man stopped walking, forcing Daiki to do the same. You were never in any real danger. The second he went for a full-on killing blow, I would have ripped his head off before he even knew what happened. Kakashi continued, directing his full attention to Daiki, and the boy felt something akin to a pressure forced down upon his shoulders, rooting him to the spot. But what if I wasn't here? Being a Jonin sensei isn't about holding your hands. You should be trusted to make your way back to the village. If I wasn't here, and you didn't have that water as a crutch, all of you would have died for your pure ignorance of the situation and utter arrogance in your own ability. Daiki found he couldn't utter a word to refute the Sharingan wielder. This is why I told the Hokage I didn't want to bring my team with me? Kakashi sighed, running a hand through his hair and looking away from Daiki. I knew exactly that Naruto and Sasuke couldn't be trusted to act as they should have. I wasn't sure about you and I knew Sakura would tag along with whatever Sasuke decided. He outright grumbled. Daiki found himself releasing a huge breath he hadn't known he'd been holding when the man looked away. It grated him that every single word the man said struck true. They had been arrogant. He'd been especially arrogant because of his own knowledge. He thought after fighting those first rain scrubs that they could handle it, even knowing there was a Jonin class enemy running the show. Clearly, he needed to grind more than just his muscle and chakra power. Well, Whatever, Kakashi shrugged his shoulders. Treat this as, as a learning experience. I will, Daiki promised. He clearly didn't have the strength yet to act as he pleased. They resumed walking, and not long later arrived at the shore of the lake, where to Daiki's slight surprise, a familiar figure was waiting. A small, cute little girl, who positively lit up when she saw them. Daiki and I, I, Shizuka shouted and quickly rushed over to him slamming into his stomach and wrapping her thin arms around his waist. You're okay. I'm so glad. Daiki was touched by her worry for him. I'm fine. He pat her on the head and assured her. Besides I told you didn't I? That I'd kick all those guys' asses. MMM. Shizuka nodded against his stomach. You were super cool. Damn right he was. He kneeled down after a moment when she pulled back and smiled at her. It's time for me to head back home but I'll come back and visit sometime, he promised her. So until then, you be a good girl and look after your mom, okay? MMM, I will, she nodded, then surprised him by leaning forward and kissing him on the cheek. I love you, Daiki and I, I, she declared, as she bid him goodbye. She ran off a moment later, waving him goodbye as she went, to which he returned as he stood up, right up until she disappeared behind a few houses. My, aren't you quite the ladies' man? Kakashi giggled. I wonder how the cute little Hyuga heiress will feel about you attracting Fu and little Shizuku. Daiki rolled his eyes. Stuff it up your ass. He retorted. Not my kink kid. Kakashi shrugged. Oh, by the way, here. Suddenly, there was a scroll in his hand and he tossed it at him. Daiki caught it and raised his eyebrow at the man. And this is? He asked. It was a ceiling scroll he could tell that much, but not what was in it. Mission pay, for a B-rank, divided four ways between Yusasuke, Naruto and Sakura, he explained. 
Oh, and the bounty for that rain kunoichi you killed and a little extra I found on her body that I'm sure you'll like. It better not be her underwear. Daiki deadpanned. Kakashi scoffed. As if a kid like you could appreciate the underwear of a mature, sexy lady. I don't want to hear that from an obvious virgin who turned to smut because he can't pull a girl. Daiki shot back. And that was how the return trip went back to Konoha. Quite the spiral of events I see. The Sande mused, leaning back in his chair. I'm beginning to think my team are cursed to be honest. Kakashi shrugged. Our missions tend to spiral like this a lot, don't they? It's only been twice. Sarutobi deadpanned at the younger man. That's practically a dozen, Kakashi shrugged. But yes, you don't need to worry about the girl. She seems perfectly stable, honestly. It's a wonder she's so upbeat with her situation. And the seal? The older man pressed. Seems to be holding strong, the copy ninja replied. Though you'd be better asking Daiki, seems he has an interest in sealing quite a bit. He caught on that she was a Jinchuriki at some point during the mission and got her to show him her seal, from what I gather, he copied it down to study. Sarutobi chortled, shaking his head in amusement. He sounds like another promising young man I once knew, he said. The similarities are quite astounding really. The innate talent they both have with the sealing arts, coming to the rescue of a female Jinchuriki, even studying their seals. I suppose he resembles Minato-sensei a bit, Kakashi nodded in agreement. Though the attitude is all wrong, he's like some weird horrifying cross of Minato-sensei, Juryazama, and Guy. Honestly, it sounded like some form of horrifying monster to Kakashi. He wondered how he was at writing smut. The chortle turned into a full-bellied laugh at the comparison. Hopefully, though, they learn a bit from this, Kakashi sighed, scratching the back of his head. It won't be long now before they start doing missions without me. They need to understand just how wrong things can go if you don't consider things properly. MMM, they are young still. But some perspective is always good to have, the Hokage pointed out. Still, it's not like you don't approve of what they did in the end. Kakashi didn't refute the older man's words because he was right. He wouldn't have written down the instructions for that lightning jutsu for the kid and pretended he looted it from that chick's body otherwise. But, he stood by his decision in the end to let things play out as they did. Tough love like this was better than them dying. At least here, he could give them that experience with an opponent in a controlled environment, where he could have ended things in an instant if they got truly dangerous. What are you doing? The familiar voice of Sasuke asked. Daiki would have loved to answer. Sadly, he could not because he was currently being crushed under the scaly foot of a huge 50-foot, pink-scaled chameleon. He is trying and failing to live up to the name of a chameleon summoner. Toka, the youngest daughter of Shiromori helpfully supplied. His sensory abilities are atrocious, much worse than our last summoner I'm told. That hurt right in the pride. And that's why he's wearing a blindfold? He heard Sasuke ask, deadpan. Or maybe he was just asking normal, that was kind of normal for him to be honest. Indeed, though it looks like our training has been cut short for the day with your arrival. Toka hummed. Let us resume another day then Daiki-san. He heard the familiar sound of smoke puffing, and then the weight squishing him into the dirt disappeared utterly. Sighing in annoyance, Daiki sat up in the crater his body had made in the ground, and reached up to pull off the blindfold he was wearing. Having fun? Sasuke asked, all raised eyebrows and amused smirk on his face. Nope, he answered dryly and pushed himself up, shaking off the ache in his bones. Ever since I showed I had enough chakra now to summon the boss, he assigned me to his daughter and has had her coming around every day for the past few weeks for a few hours to help me train my sensing abilities. He'd found that as far as chakra units went, it cost a total of 25,000 to summon Shiromori, more than half his current full capacity. Oh well, at least he'd been accepted by the clan now. He didn't know how, but they had been watching him and Shiromori had declared that him giving up the chance to have another powerful summoning clan at his beck and call, showed how loyal of a person he was, worthy of the clan, and immediately declared right after, that he was also an embarrassment with how poor his sensory abilities were. The fool. How the hell did he even have kids if he'd spent the last fifty years stuck as a castle? And how is that going for you? Sasuke asked, smirk growing, tauntingly. He knew it wasn't going well at all. You could take the Uchiha out of the prick, but you could never remove the prick from an Uchiha. 
whatever the hell that meant. I'd love to see you try to sense someone that could remove all sound they make, turn pretty much invisible and remove their scent as well, then fight them blindfolded. Daiki snorted. So what brings you here? Back for another ass kicking. That removed the smirk from his face right quick. No, I'm not here to toss you around today. The other boy shrugged. Kakashi left us to solo train today, but Sakura was particularly clingy. So I gave her the slip at my place and came here since I knew you'd still be training here. I'm just about done for the day as well anyway. Daiki mused. I'm gonna hit up the shopping district. I need to up my weights again and I've put off buying new weapons to replace the ones you destroyed, beyond filling up his kitchen and crap to last him. For the last twenty days since he got back from the waterfall village, he'd thrown himself back into the grind, and not only because he needed to get stronger so what happened in waterfall didn't happen again, but also because he had a bunch of new jutsu to get down in the meantime. He'd accomplished much in the last twenty days. Not only had he finished up learning the chakra flow technique, He'd also gotten down the wave emission technique from Fu, granted, he'd only been able to transmit a few clipped words to her, while she could have an entire minute-long conversation in his head, but he was getting there, and she sure did love to talk. Every few hours, she'd send him a transmission chattering about something. Her favorite topic so far was complaining about Rainmaru and how much of a prick he was. She was having a bit of trouble earning the fish's respect, but she was doing all right at least, which was of the good. And on top of that, it hadn't taken him long to get down the jutsu Kakashi had found on the body of that rain lady, whose name he didn't recall. And lucky for him, it was a nifty C-rank lightning jutsu. Lightning style, Elekiter. A single hand seal, rather fast jutsu that generated a powerful electric current around the user's palms, used with a palm thrust, and worked very well with the force palm jutsu. It was incredible how coincidental it was he got a jutsu like that, and made him wonder idly if it was actually Kakashi just giving him it as a reward for being a prick. But in the end, Daiki didn't care. Beyond Sasuke coming to spar him with, he hadn't seen much of anyone else, Hinata popped by twice, but only stayed for a little while because her team was running quite a lot of missions lately, and Tenten only once the day after he got back because her sensei apparently wanted to take their whole team on a month-long training trip outside the village. Probably in preparation for the Chunin exams. The time to himself had done wonders for his overall abilities, though that was for sure. Name, Daiki Yuriai, age, 13, Chakra Capacity, 49, 200 slash 49, 200 Jonin, Strength, 110 slash 510, Endurance, 160 slash 510, Durability, 110 slash 510, Agility, 110 out of 510, Taijutsu, 175 slash 500, Ninjutsu, 195 slash 500, Jinjutsu, 10 out of 500, Bukijutsu, 75 out of 500, Chakra Control, 195 slash 500, Chakra Affinities, Lightning, Adept you have stepped onto the path of roaring thunder, Kyunjutsu, Journeyman the world breathes. He honestly had no idea what to think of his Fuinjutsu stat, to be honest. He'd spent hours every day poring over the copy of the Four Symbol Seal, learning every little bit of it he could, and when he finally came to fully understand it just two days ago, his Fuinjutsu had rose from adept to journeyman. And seriously, what was up with that cryptic bullcrap? The world breathes like, okay? But why though? It seriously felt like the system was just spouting random gibberish to mess with him. At least my chakra capacity has reached Jonin tier. He sighed inwardly. Thankfully, there was no elite Chunin tier. Planning on going on a mission? Sasuke asked. Something like that. Daiki shrugged. Now that he had the four symbol seal and could inscribe it fluently, he was planning on putting his plan to the test. All right, let's go then. Sasuke shrugged. I need to buy a few more demon windmill shuriken anyway. What's with your obsession with those by the way? Daiki found himself asking as the pair of them left the training ground behind and headed out back into the village towards the shopping district. In the end, he would see the most growth if he went after Isabu early. He had a limited time frame to do it in either way, and he doubted he'd get strong enough for the endgame if he didn't do it early. Besides, he also doubted he'd be strong enough to beat Isabu down and force him either way so the only option left was convincing him. 
which could be a problem, considering he was hiding at the bottom of a massive, massive lake and Daiki didn't fancy his chances in jumping in and swimming down to him. Seriously, meet the Leviathan in the depths? No thank you. Thankfully, Fu had solved that issue for him. Else he would have had to sit at the edge of the lake and shout the Bijou's name over and over and hope he drew its attention. The only way he had of making this happen was letting Isabu know what was going to happen in the future roughly, and then convincing the Bijou to become his partner so they could become strong enough together to deal with what was coming. He knew for a fact Isabu definitely did not want to become a part of the Jubi again. And if he did join willingly, well, a willing Bijou meant he would have instant access. And with Isabu backing him up, he could deal with Raiga and Ranmaru, and then while he was at it, he could bum rush the village of artisans who were also in the land of rivers. Those guys who at the end of part one, went after Gara with a bunch of incredibly powerful chakra weapons like those soaring short swords that let the chick using them outwin Jutsu Temari, and use Shikaka's chakra drawn from Gara to revive their dead leader. And it all came together with that. Raiga teaming up with them to revive that leader, using Ranmaru's eyes to capture Isabu, in return for them them turning the Kiba blades into super weapons far beyond what they were currently using the Bijou's power as well. In one fell swoop, he would become a Jinchuriki, have full access to the power of a Bijou, gain a pair of incredibly powerful Dejitsu eyes, one of the legendary sets of swords from the mist and a bunch of other powerful chakra weapons. It was the perfect plan. Walking beside Sasuke, Daiki's lips twisted into a massive grin. The next morning, Daiki made his way to the Hokage Tower, a confident gait in his steps. It was time after all. He'd cut his training off entirely after shopping with Sasuke and getting something to eat together. Though the weirdo had bought a whole platter of tomatoes to eat at a restaurant. Who did that? He'd splurged a lot yesterday, spending a full 100,000 Rio on stocking up his Dimension Force Seal with Kanai and Shuriken. 200 of each to be precise. Thankfully, he wasn't lacking in money right now even after spending that much, he still had over 1.5 million Rio to his name. Not only because of the bounties he got, but because every day since he got back, he'd been sending a clone off to do a D-rank mission, upping his mission record nicely. Shadow clones were so useful. Ah, Daiki-kun. The Sandame greeted him as he entered the mission assignment room. Good to see you. Not sending a clone this time? He smiled knowingly. As expected of the Hokage. No, not this time Hokage-sama. Daiki chuckled. I'm hoping to go on a C-rank mission today, preferably one to somewhere I've not been before. I want to see more of outside the village. Hmm, is that so? The Hokage mused. There are many beautiful places out there, but I'm afraid it will still have to be a mission around the general area. Not too far from our territory. You're not quite ready to head out into fully hostile areas yourself. That's fine. I know my limits. Daiki shrugged. Have you got any missions into the land of rivers? Or somewhere around there? They're not far. And there's apparently lots of beautiful lakes and stuff there. They do indeed Daikikuen, a splendid place to go fishing as well. You can find some lovely bass there. The Sandame stroked his chin. I do we believe we have one mission there now that I think about it. To the land of artisans actually. It's a general mission that comes in every few months. They want us to deliver a small shipment of specific or that can only be found here in fire country. You should be able to handle that without much trouble. Daiki had to fight to stop the massive smile from spreading across his face. I'll take it, he agreed instantly. I've wanted to visit that place for a while actually, to see about maybe getting my hands on a good chakra weapon. You and many others? The older man laughed lightly. I dare say you've saved up enough over the past month though to get your hands on a decent one, so I wish you luck on your hunt. Thank you. Daiki replied simply, accepting the words humbly. After all, he would take all the luck he could get to help him with what he was planning on doing. You know, Daiki actually had to hand it to Isabu, if the giant turtle bijou was actually where he thought it was. If he was, the three-tailed bijou was literally chilling out in a lake, dead center between two of the main five hidden villages, the leaf and the sand. And not a single person had found out about it being there. Again, that's only if he's here. Daiki mused. Currently, he found himself atop a large cliffside pier that stretched out a bit over the humongous lake. It hadn't taken him any longer than a dozen or so hours to reach here. He was a bit tired, but he could easily keep going. It was hard to even make the lake out below him. The second he entered the general vicinity of the lake, 
He found that there was a massive fog barrier everywhere, stretching out as far as the eye could see. Which granted wasn't very far because of said fog, but Daiki was sure it covered the entire lake for the most part. With his suspicions of who was in this lake, that sent alarm bells ringing in the back of his head. Isabu can create an illusionary mist after all and has water techniques, who's to say he can't use the hidden mist jutsu as well, he's been with the mist village for decades. He thought to himself, arms crossed, and who else but a bijou would be able to sustain such a massive fog for any long period of time? Well, if his suspicions were right and this fog was created by a jutsu that was, all right, I can do this. He hyped himself up. There was a tremor in his legs that he was doing his very best to ignore. Because plan or not, this was a freaking bijou he was going to attempt to reason with. It was for that reason specifically that he had a clone waiting in the tree line, waiting to use the replacement technique with him if the negotiations at all went awry. If Isabu attacked him, he was booking it back to Kanoha and informing the Hokage that he found the three tails while touring one of the lakes on his way to the village of artisans. Either way, he was going to crap on the Akatsuki over, and he would offer himself up as a Jinchuriki for Isabu if the Sandame decided to seal the Sandby. He'd just have to put Raiga and Ranmaru off until later in that case. It was still a bijou. Daiki slapped his cheeks. Don't pussy out! He told himself before hesitation could settle in fully. The strength he'd earned through the grind would see him through, one way or another. Daiki made a single hand seal and focused his chakra, before extending both hands outwards towards the lake. From his hands, rippling waves of sound began to emanate down towards the lake. The wave transmission jutsu was an interesting thing. One had to know the specific chakra frequency of someone if they were trying to send a message to them alone. But, if not set to any frequency, the technique transferred the message to every living thing within the vicinity of the sound waves, which was what he did to make sure Isabu got the message. A simple message, five words, repeated over and over. Isabu, I've come to bargain. He transmitted the message over and over. Thankfully for Daiki, the lake, while massive, wasn't anything compared to the distance between the leaf and waterfall villages. And so, he didn't need to expend anywhere near the amount of chakra for this as he did when trying to send messages to Fu. He expected he would be here for a while, after all, he was sure Isabu, if he was here, would hear the message and have to process the fact that somebody out there knew his name, his name that should only be known to his siblings and the Sage of Six Paths, then take the time to contemplate if this was a trap or a massive resounding splash of water shot through the air. Nay, calling it a splash of water did it no justice at all, it was like a gargantuan geyser that could pulverize a mountain. Suddenly just shot up from the depths of the lake and roared up into the heavens, piercing up through the clouds themselves. Or so he assumed, since he couldn't actually see that far up with the fog and all. And from within the massive geyser, a huge, titanic shadow seemed to seep up through it and become visible even through the fog. A split moment later, the fog and geyser both seemed to dissipate almost instantly and Daiki's mouth hung low as he stared up into a terrifying, gleaming yellow and red eye surrounded by concentrated rings, almost akin to the Rinnegan in aesthetics. Easily as large as Shiromari, if not larger, the huge head of the Sandby stared down at him, its single eye pinning him in place with the sheer weight its mere presence exuded. <clears throat> Holy crap, this was a bad idea. For a moment, neither spoke. Daiki because he couldn't actually muster the willpower to at the moment, and Isabu because the giant shelled bijou seemed to be examining him. The one to break the silence was the turtle. Human, how do you know my name? Isabu spoke, the bijou's voice was distinctly male, with a calm bass timber to it. It echoed powerfully, yet was not booming. Daiki opened and closed his mouth, floundering for a moment before gritting his teeth. What was the point of being one with the grind if he was going to biatch out at a critical moment like this? Through some bad luck that worked out well for me, Daiki soldiered on. I'll be blunt, you and your siblings, the other bijou, are in danger. The only reaction Isabu gave to his words was one single, slow, languished blink. Is that so? The bijou responded simply. And how does this change anything? We are always in danger, you humans are always chasing us, sealing us away for your own benefit. The fact you know I am here is a threat in of itself to me. Well, he wasn't wrong. You're not wrong, Daiki said as such. But this goes beyond even that. 
I'll be straight with you big guy. I've seen the future and what's gonna happen in the next few years. It isn't pretty. I came looking for you because I need your help, and you need mine. Not an unheard of power. Isabu inclined his head slightly in a nod. But tell me, how does this pertain to a danger to me? A few years, a few decades, it makes little difference to me, another shinobi war perhaps. Shall I be caught and sealed again? You're remarkably at ease about the thought of being sealed inside a Jinshiriki again. He couldn't help but point out. Isabu tilted his head to the side slightly. Should I not be? He asked. In the end, whatever human I'm sealed into will die at some point. And I'll be sealed again or get a chance to escape. Either way, humans come and go, but we bijou always come back. Daiki grimaced. Yeah, that's kind of the thing, he began. If things don't go in a specific way in the future, which only happens because of a lot of luck, none of you will come back. All that will remain of you is the Jubi. Isabu's one single eye that had been gazing down at him calmly, almost boredly, flew wide open in shock. What? How? That is impossible. Isabu's cool was completely lost. Daiki swallowed. Even just a narrow of this guy's I was terrifying. No killing intent needed. Not if someone like Madara Uchiha has the Rinnegan and can summon the Ghetto Mazo. He refuted. Isabu froze completely. The, the Rinnegan, just like father? The huge shelled bijou trembled in place, and Daiki bore witness to his trio of enormous armored tails jerking back and forth in the water in clear agitation. Such a simple gesture, creating thick roiling waves in the lake surface. Madara Uchiha passed on his Rinnegan when he died to an Uzumaki child to use as a pawn and has had a subordinate manipulating things in the background. Daiki pushed on. You should know him well, he was mind controlling your former host, Yagura. Yes him, I remember him. But why? I don't understand what the point of that was now that you have told me this. Isabu murmured, confused. If their plan is to bring back the Jubi, why not just capture me then? To cause chaos, Daiki answered. They're pitting the villages against each other, while creating an organization of S-rank shinobi, all for the purpose of capturing all of your siblings. And well, that guy has a specific grudge against you in particular. I see, Isabu replied simply, seemingly deep in thought. But why does he have a grudge against me? Because he was in love with your Jinshiriki before Yagura, Daiki said bluntly. The girl you were forced into, a former Kunoichi of Kanoha or Dash. Rin, yes, I remember. Isabu sighed, single eye closing. I see, I understand. There are only two questions I must ask of you. I'll answer if I can. Daiki shrugged. He found himself becoming much more comfortable talking to the Bijou as time went on. He just had to grind through the conversation and adapt to the presence of the terrifyingly powerful giant turtle. That was all. Why does Madara Achiha want to reform the Jubi? Isabu asked. It is an ancient, mindless beast that's only purpose in life is destroying all in its way. Daiki shrugged. He wants to be the new sage of six paths, he answered. He thinks with the Rinnegan and being the Jinchiriki of the Jubi, he'll reach the same level as the original sage of six paths. A shuddering breath exhaled through the guard over Isabu's mouth. How foolish, what a contemptible man. The Bijou spat, the first hint of anything rude leaving his mouth at all before the giant turtle sighed and met Daiki's eyes again. Very well, my final question. Why did you seek me out to tell me this? What do you mean by you need my help? Daiki winced. Yeah, that's the part you're not gonna like, he sighed, before shrugging and chugging along. There's nowhere you can hide. Not even your personal little dimension thing. The guy who controlled Yugura has a space-time ninjutsu that lets him break into things like that as well. So you even know about that ability of mine? I see. Isabu mused, but said nothing else. Letting Daiki continued. He took a deep breath and decided to just put it out there, like ripping off a band-aid. I'm planning on doing everything I can to get strong enough to beat them and make sure they can't revive the Jubi. He put out there. Then narrowed his eyes at Isabu and made sure the Bijou made sure he was being absolutely serious. To that end, I want to become your Jinchiriki. No, not just a simple Jinchiriki. The only way this will work is if you willingly join me and ally with me, allowing me to become a perfect Jinchiriki. Isabu said nothing, and silence echoed between them. Daiki crossed his arms and held the Bijou's gaze. 
I have more options I can pursue to getting stronger, but becoming a Jinchuriki will speed up my training immensely, he stated. But, there's a not small chance I will die before I ever get strong enough to make a difference. With your strength backing me up, I can immediately go after something else I want that will allow me to cloak my chakra completely, making it so none can ever tell I would be a Jinchuriki in the first place. Even if, Madara stood right next to me and stared at me with the Rinnegan. For all the abilities Rammer's eyes had, the one that Daiki most wanted, was the ability to cloak the user's chakra signature so thoroughly not even the Byakugan could see through it at point-blank range. With those eyes, not a single person would be able to tell he was a Jinchuriki, unless he used Isabu's chakra right in front of them. Finally, Isabu spoke. You speak quite confidently of your plans, the Bijou hummed. But, you realize what is needed for you to become a perfect Jinchuriki? A full partnership between us would mean nothing blocking my access from you, the only purpose of a seal would be to hold me, not block me from leaving. The implications there were heavy. He would have to be willing to trust Isabu with his life. I'm not a little biatch Isabu, and I don't plan on leaving my fate and the fate of the world on the prophecy boy said to save the world and bring peace and all that nonsense. It's hard to when you've grown up beside the idiot, Daiki smirked. And I wasn't sure if he even did win in the end, I didn't see that far. And with the enemies that are coming, so strong they make the ruling Kage look like wet behind the ears Jenin. I need all the strength I can get. Without you, that's the best I'll amount to. Daiki uncrossed his arms and thrust a hand out to point up at the towering Bijou whose head hovered over 50 feet above him, despite him being atop a cliff that was over 250 feet high. I'll put my life in your hands and go right down this path with you at my side, he declared. And together, if my plans work out nicely, We'll get strong enough through the grind to be able to slap that pansy-ass Juby around even if it did get revived. Isabu gave him a languid stare. You're an odd little human, aren't you? At least I don't rap. Daiki snorted. Your brother Gyuki has to deal with that. Isabu shook his massive head. It's been a long time since I spoke with a human that did not consider me a monster. The giant turtle mused, almost nostalgically, before looking Daiki in the eye. Very well, what you speak of, is far too private knowledge for you to have just come across it, especially with how easily you speak our names. I'll lend you my aid. Now tell me human. You know my name, but what is yours? Daiki jabbed a finger against his chest. The name is Daiki. Daiki Yurii, it means shining spirit. A name fit for a guy like me and my dedication to the grind. He boldly introduced himself. Pleasure to have you on board, buddy. Daiki. A good name indeed, Isabu nodded. But, are you not forgetting something? No, I don't think so, Daiki blinked. What do you mean? He asked, confused. Isabu sighed. A bit too gung-ho perhaps, he mused. What I mean is, how do you plan on sealing me inside you? You seem to have come alone after all. Oh, I've already taken care of that. Daiki shrugged the question off, reaching down and grasping his shirt at the base before pulling it up and over his head, leaving his muscular torso bare, and exposing the four rectangular black ink blocks spread about each corner leading to the center of his chest. I've already learned a strong enough seal to hold you, so you ready? He was eager and excited to get this show on the road. Isabu blinked. You are skilled in the sealing arts? Enough to seal one such as I at your age? Interesting. Isabu hummed, before chuckling. Very well. Show me your skill, Daiki. I am ready. All right. Brace yourself then. Daiki warned, bringing his hands up and clasping them into a ram seal, focusing his chakra and flowing it through the seal on his chest. Sealing characters spread out from the tops of the ink blocks, forming a spiderweb-like patter on the center of his chest, just like Fu, before suddenly, lighting up brightly with chakra and the characters began to form up and out of his chest, reaching into the thin air in the dozens forming what looked like inky black chains made of up conjoined ceiling symbols and lashing out through the air like striking serpents, growing and expanding to massive sizes. They wrapped around the massive bijou a moment later, and despite Isabu's epic size, the turtle was lifted into the air as if he were a feather. Though, of course Daiki only knew it happened like this because Isabu allowed it if he wanted, he could break free from these few injutsu chains as easy as breathing. Isabu was dragged through the hair headfirst, making contact with Daiki and moments later, submerging into the seal inscribed on his chest. 
As soon as Isabu disappeared completely, Daiki felt something click into place and a connection form between the seal and his chakra network, and he collapsed on his backside, panting in exhaustion. Crap! That used up a ton of chakra, he gasped, and realized he was sweating quite intensely. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.